Oh, yeah. Just as a reminder. Oh, this, that's good. This podcast is not sponsored by a monster, but we sure wish it were. The unofficial sponsor of Life on Books. Nothing gets me hyped up to talk about books more than a nice, cold monster energy drink. <laughs> Working on that sponsorship plug already, yeah. huh? Practice in my ad reads. Nice. Welcome to the year-end extravaganza for the Life on Books podcast. Ooh. I'm your host, Tony. With me, as always, is Andy, a.k.a. Metafictional Meathead. Extravaganza. Let's How you do, do it. Let's do it. How you doing today? I'm not I'm doing all right. So uh, today we're going to be talking about just a, a general recap of our year of reading, our top 10 favorites, uh, some authors we read for the first time, some books we didn't like, our shortest and longest reads. Uh, we're going to pick a book for each other to read in 2024. And uh, I want to do a quick uh, recount of just how the year went as a, a bookstagrammer yeah. slash book talker, yeah, yeah. booktuber, book podcaster. Um, and I also want to just start out by saying, uh, you know, thank you to everyone who has uh, listened to the podcast or watched um, the videos that I've put out. Um, special thanks to Andy, which, uh, you know, if you followed me early on, I made some content talking about this, but obviously the Life on Books social media accounts have grown quite a bit. So I had always had an interest in maybe making book-related content, but I, I'm kind of a YouTube was my main thing, and I felt like the book content on YouTube certainly has dropped off over the years. Yeah, probably. And, uh, you know, it was thanks to Andy who kind of uh, inspired me to uh, make book content on Instagram because you found a, a very uh, active community of people talking about books and maybe some books that just aren't as popular. Um, yeah. Some more serious literature, uh, classics, um, and, and definitely like uh, really impactful nonfiction uh, discussions going on. And I just think... Um, not not just like it's cool to see, you know, you gain followers and, and videos do well and all that stuff. But uh, just that I think we've had we've both had some amazing interactions with people definitely on social media. And a great example is the video that I posted yesterday about, you know, why continue to push your book reading goals higher and higher and higher. And that video has maybe 20,000 views on it, which is like, OK, but there's way, way more comments yeah. uh, than most videos get. And not only are they just like, they're not just really shallow comments. People are really, here's why I do it or here's why I don't do it. And, or here's been my experience with this. And uh, I think it's just really cool to see that, that uh, conversation. To yeah. Be I took a look at it when you, you told me it was popping off and uh, people had a lot of insightful things to say. Yeah. Yeah, so thank you to everyone who's participated uh, or engaged with Life on Books or Andy's account, Metafictional Meathead. Uh, and thanks to Andy for inspiring the whole thing to get started. And I'd also like to say, uh, you know, thank you for doing the podcast. Yeah. Uh, because I, I kind of realized that, um, especially with the way everyone's lives work now, there are pretty. it's pretty rare that you just sit down and just talk to somebody about one subject for an hour. Yeah. I think that was probably more common before social media, um, before the internet, really, which most of you probably don't remember. <laughs> I, I barely remember it because I kind of grew up with the internet. I was like the first generation to, to kind of have it. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, I mean, I can't really think of another instance where I just like hang out with a friend or two or, and just like right, talk about yeah. one specific thing. Yeah. And I think about, and I, I know you and I maybe talked about this before in the past, but I think about, um, like listening parties for new albums that used to be a thing, a new mm -hmm. album would come out and people would get together and have some drinks and just sit and listen to an album. Like that's, that's unheard of now. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's been cool. I mean, how do you feel about the podcast? I think it's been great. I was going to say on, on the, the flip side of everything you just said, I, I just wanted to thank you for inviting me to do this. It's, it's certainly not something I would have endeavored to take on uh, on my own. It's been a lot of fun. I, I, uh, I kind of joked with um, both uh, Chad Post and Chris Via, Leaf by Leaf. Mm. I was talking to them recently, and it was just kind of like, um, you know, I'm very fortunate that I just kind of show up and ramble into a mic. And <laughs> um, I, I, I've kind of joked like I'm, this is your podcast, and I'm the co-host, kind of sort of. I, you know, I, I am very appreciative of it 
that you you are doing all the stuff on the back end and yeah it's it certainly makes the the conversation a lot more fun and um it's been great to you know sit down and just rap about books and everything in between yeah i certainly think of the podcast as ours you yeah. know what i mean and i understand that it's kind of hosted on like my youtube channel um yeah. but I think I've done like maybe one or two kind of episodes by myself and it's just not really like yeah that cool. <laughs> uh, it's like, yeah, I have opinions. I get to share them, but I don't know. I'd rather just have a discussion with somebody. Yeah, definitely. And uh, also I think um, it's, it, it's just one of those things where like it's motivation. Yeah. To, you know, uh, I actually really look forward to the discussion, not, and not just in the sense of like, I want to grow a podcast and we need to get content out. It's like, no, I actually look forward to sitting down and and, and talking about it. So, and uh, for those that don't know, um, like I I talked a few weeks ago about why you should start a book talk or a bookstagram account because you have a special voice. And my videos are probably a little bit higher production quality than you would see. I do this professionally. Yeah. So I already have all this stuff. Don't think that you need a fancy camera and mics and all this insane stuff um, to get started. I mean, you do a great job just like literally just taking some photos of your books and posting them. So um, more than anything, I just think the quality of the content itself is the most important thing. I like to have a really nice lighting and all the fancy stuff because I'm just like a a gear geek. But um, that's certainly not necessary. So. Anyway, well, let's get uh, let's get into the topic. So, uh, in spite of me making a post about <laughs> the number of books you should read and all that <laughs> stuff, and, and being against uh, setting book goals as far as total volume of books, uh, I know people probably will be interested. So, how many books did you read? Just give me like a general overview of your stats, I guess. I read. Uh, I actually finished one more this morning, which brought my total to the year for to one hundred and eighteen books. Wow! So, um, it's not really a number uh, you know 100 books is not really a number i set out to reach yeah um i think last year especially towards the end of the year i got a little bit caught up in quantity of books which i think is is natural for most people like the the end of the year is approaching it's happened to me the year before you know the end of the year is approaching you're like oh, i want to get more books in i want to you know push that number a little bit but um <clears throat> You know, at the at the start of the year, you know, you, you get the option on Goodreads to like set your your goal for the year. Mm-hmm. Um, I set it as one book just because I wanted to read, and you well, know, you I, certainly met that. <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, I, you know, the the one thing that kind of stinks about Goodreads is they don't do the like um, year like the tracker like from as the year kind of goes on. Mm. If you don't set a goal, I oh, think right, I think if right. you don't do anything, though, you'll still get the like recap at the end of the year. But I wanted to kind of track it live. Yeah. Um, and you know, I didn't really have any sort of, like I said, particular uh, quantitative goal in mind. I just wanted to get get some good reading done. Um, I I quickly realized towards the start of the year that I would not be able to read the types of books I had been reading in the the past, or at least as frequently as I had been reading those books. So, um, you know, I started gravitating towards shorter books. Um, books that were maybe were not as demanding um certainly still had some rewarding reads um and it wasn't until i got to like that 70 75 page or excuse me um book t- number that i was like i could probably read 100 yeah um it is not something i will strive to do again um i kind of commented this on y- your post about reading goals um unless you you really want to do it like like i said it, it's kind of cool to be like i read 100 books this year like it, it is a, a a fun thing to say it does feel like an accomplishment yeah i don't want to diminish it but it, uh, unless you are like purely like really want that that quantitative goal like i wouldn't recommend doing it um y- you know at, at the end of the day like it is kind of an arbitrary number, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, I do think in some areas with some of the, the less demanding books, at least, you know, my, my comprehension was, was lacking a little bit just cause like, you know, I, I understood what was happening in the book on kind of a surface level, but 
because it was maybe a little bit less demanding or shorter or, and, you know, there were certainly times where I was like, I'm just going to finish this book and, you know, add a number on the board. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm sure you could pick maybe half of the books that I read this year, you know, hopefully not that many, but, um, and I could give you a very cursory explanation of what took place, but yeah. beyond that, I, I wouldn't have much to say. Um, <clears throat> So, but you know, not, I don't want to like dwell on the, the downsides. Cause I, I don't think, I think overall it was a, a positive year of reading. Yeah. So I'm not going to be like, you know, poo poo reading a lot of books. There's certainly an unspoken, um, connotation that comes with reading books, whether people want to admit it or not, people think that people who read books are smart. Right. And or worldly or whatever superlative you want to throw at it. And uh, and so I think that's part of the reason why people get caught up in it. And certainly with like, I'm not going to name any specific uh, Facebook groups, but you and I were part of a Facebook group that we found was probably not for us. Yeah. Uh, and that book was a, a big offender of, oh, I read 300 books this year. Right. And... I know both you and I are very conscious to not put down any people's reading choices to each their own. Right. However, if you did look at a lot of what they were choosing to read, just not a lot of substance. Yeah. And credit to some people in this group. Some folks did push back and were like, do you even remember any of that? Right. And uh, this one woman that had read something like she she read some th- somewhere in the three hundreds, and she said that was a slow year for her. And um, someone was like, "Do you remember what you read?" And she goes, um, "I have a hard time remembering the names of the books, but I can just give you I can give you a general idea of what the book was about if you like put the book in front of me, right?" Everyone has different reasons for reading, and if if you are hedonist and you just read for straight up entertainment (laughs) and you just want to dedicate all your time to that. And that's the most pleasurable activity in your life. Sure. I guess read 500 romance novels or whatever. Uh, but I, I was thinking about, uh, and and I don't want to say the name because it's in my top 10, but I was thinking about this book that I read this year and the writing was unbelievable. Just so good and so descriptive and just the the pros are amazing, but you didn't necessarily need to pay attention to them to Mm -hmm. get the gist of the story. And so you could kind of like, and and everyone's experienced this where you read a paragraph and then you kind of go like, wait a second, what? Like I didn't really register that. That could very easily happen with this book and you could still get the general gist of what's going on, Mm -hmm. but you would have completely missed the beauty of the writing. Right. Uh, and it's like, yeah, do I need to sit here and read a paragraph where he's not, nothing's really happening in the plot or the characters. Maybe they're just describing the world that they're in. Yeah. You don't need to absorb it to get what's, what's happening in the story. But man, that's like, that is why you are reading this book. If you actually sit and take the time to really think about the words and let them sink in, you just go, wow, this is beautiful writing. So Everyone has different goals, and yeah, I, and I think it was nonfiction fervor on Instagram had asked, uh, maybe maybe it was somebody else, but they said, um, "Well, you know, if it's not number of books, what what do you think about page count?" Kind of saying like instead of you know, because a lot of people say if I have a high book goal, I shy away from bigger books. Yeah, I think the problem with page count also is it's still in a way like gamifying it. Yeah. And it, it's kind of turning reading into just statistics. Yeah. Uh, and so what was interesting is quite a few people commented on that post and had said, um, well, you know, I want to stop doom scrolling or, or I, I have set the goal to spend more time reading. It's like, okay, then make the goal reading time. Right. <laughs> you know, like, right. And that's going to be part of my goal for 2024 is to to spend cumulative, cumulatively an hour per day on average reading. And it doesn't matter if I read big books, small books, lots of pages, a few pages. I will have much spent my time in a much better way than yeah doing whatever else. So, yeah. uh, so you read 118, which is 
almost exactly three times as many books as I read. <laughs> I read somewhere between 42 and 45. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I do track it, but I, I don't know. I didn't really look that closely. Um, of those 40, let's we'll call it 45, I believe eight of them were audio books. Um, and so I guess if we're counting audio books, you can put me at 119. 119. You did yeah. one audio book. This one year. audio book. And it was your only nonfiction as well, right? Uh, no, I actually finished a nonfiction book yesterday. Oh, what was that? Uh, a swim in, a swim in the pond, a swim in a pond in the rain by hmm. George Saunders. Cool. So how was that? It was all right. Yeah, it was. So the thing that was, um, for those who don't know, it, it's George Saunders is a, a writer and he also teaches um, at Syracuse University, mm -hmm. which is a pretty good writing and MFA program. Um, and one of the courses he teaches there is a course on the Russian short story. Oh, cool. You kind of, you know, examine Russian short stories and get deeper into them and things like that. And he kind of boiled down um, the course into a book. So he he you would get sections where it was, like you would read the short story and then his kind of commentary on it and talking about the the technical aspects of it mm -hmm. and like why um, the author might have chosen to to do this um put this in the story or omit this or why he might write like this and kind of examining their style and things like that mm -hmm. um it was it definitely interesting what was kind of a a hiccup for me is both of those things, um, short stories and the old Russians, are not really my cup of tea. Yeah, you know, I certainly do like some short story writers. There are plenty of short stories that I've enjoyed, and collections of short stories that I've enjoyed. Um, but at least in the last year or so, I've kind of temporarily lost interest in in you know the old Russians. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the stories themselves, I wasn't that like enthused about. Sure, which made reading the the commentary and the analysis on them kind of I don't want to say moot, but like less interesting. Yeah, you know. So, but it, it was a pretty interesting book. I mean, I think if if you want to, um, you know, understand a little bit more of the technical side of fiction and how it works and and why it's important then um it would be a worthwhile read but cool All not right. not gonna crack like any of my top top lists so, so. and Andy was two two non-fictions for the year <laughs> fantastic i was uh almost split 50 50 uh a little bit uh towards the fiction side one out um which was i think last year was similar but years prior was like probably 90% nonfiction yeah. and mostly fiction, uh, 10% fiction. I well, know you've made a, a conscious effort to get more into fiction yeah. this year. And I think, excuse me, um, going forward, I, I, I don't know if I'll go like all out into the nonfiction side of stuff, but I would definitely love to read, excuse me, a few more here and there. So yeah, let's, before we start, we'll get to our top 10 very shortly for those of you who are listening or watching for that reason. But, um, Let's just talk about, so you read 119 books. Mm -hmm. How do you think you have changed as a reader over the past year, if at all? Well, I've definitely grown an appreciation for shorter books. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's not, um, it, it's not a medium that I had ever like, you know, looked down on or, or strongly disliked. It just cause it wasn't really like my preference. Um, which you can tell by yeah. how thick these books in your yeah. top 10 are. Yeah. But, um, I definitely, you know, gravitated towards them more this year and kind of grew an appreciation for them. Um, I, I think, um, you know, having got into more serious or reading in general and then more serious reading, you know, only within the last like two or three years, I think, you know, starting out, I kind of had this like idea of not necessarily books like I had to read, mm -hmm. but there was a part of me that felt like I was playing catch up. Yeah. And like, you know, you have these, these big weighty tomes, um, you know, books that uh, you could either classify as, as classics or 
masterpieces or must reads or whatever. You know, I felt like I had to um, get caught up and read read some of those. And I think I'm getting to a point now where it's more just like I'm going to read something because I'm interested. Yeah. You know, and I don't want to say like I was just kind of, you know, checking off, you know, top 100 books you must read, kind of going down the list and like knocking those off. I've always, you know, been like, a okay, well, I'm not interested in this, so I'm not going to read it, you know, um, and, and definitely will only continue with reading with something if I'm enjoying it and, and am interested in it. But I think I've kind of hit a point now where I'm like, okay, like I've, 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 I have checked off enough of these, you know, important books that I can just, you know, I, I don't feel compelled to read anything for any reason other than my own, um, interest. There's certainly a really, for me, a big sense of accomplishment when I finish a big book. I yeah. think 500, maybe 600 pages or more. Yeah. Probably 500 or more. You really feel like, wow, I yeah. did it, you know? And it's not easy to read long books, even if the writing isn't super dense. Um, but I, I would agree with you that I've kind of also gained an appreciation for very short books this uh-huh. year because uh, while well, we talked with Ed Park on our last episode about how long it took him to write same bed, different dreams. And that's a, not only a fairly long book, a little over 500 pages, but it is kind of a, it has a very interesting narrative structure. There's a lot of different threads. Right. And that took him about nine years to write. And so I do appreciate the amount of effort that probably goes into a long book but also a very short book that can really emotionally f- make an impact on you is very impressive from Absolutely. The, the artistry. It's like you had 95 pages or 128 pages to like take me through this emotional journey. So I really yeah. did also get, uh, get uh, an appreci- appreciation for that. And a book that really st- stands out in that way for me uh, was a book that you just brought back uh, that you, you borrowed was uh, fever dream mm-hmm. by Samantha Schweblin. Um, pretty short. What how what was that? Like 130 or something Give like or that? Give or take. Yeah. And, uh, really obs- kind of unique, uh, book. And I, I, I thought it was great. And so a book like that, that you can read in like an hour or two and, and really just be like that, that's the type of book where like, I might not think about it every day, but I'll certainly remember it. Right. You know what I mean? Um, so I, I definitely got an appreciation for, uh, shorter books as well. I think if you make book related content, there's also an appeal to reading shorter books because then you have more books to make content about. Yeah. And I know uh, when I first made these accounts and started posting about books, uh, you know, I kind of looked around to see what some other successful creators were doing. And there was a guy on TikTok. He had like 300,000 followers and he was like, I'm giving up my account because He's like, I just feel so much pressure to like read certain books yeah. and to constantly be like putting out content. Uh, and I, now that I'm basically a year in, um, I can appreciate that, that feeling. I think for me, I really try to put out more than just book reviews. Right. I try to put out other fun stuff like short bios about interesting authors or, tips or tricks that I found helpful for my own reading journey or just like kind of like the video I put out the other day was uh, like the top rated and lowest rated book in my, right. My collection, stuff like that's just kind of fun to fill in the blanks. And, and cause I do, uh, I did, I didn't read a ton of super long books this year uh, for no particular reason. It just ha- kind of how it worked out. Uh, but there's a few really, really big books that I do want to read in 2024. So yeah, I know that um, I'm, I'm the same. Well, and we'll talk about our, our kind of plans for the future towards the end. But yeah. like, I, you know, I, I, I posted a stack um, the other day of, you know, books I'd like to read my kind of reading list for 2024. And there's some, some big books in there. Yeah. I think, you know, like I said, I, I, I really developed an appreciation for um, shorter books this year. Um, but also towards the end of the year is when I got back into reading bigger books. Yeah. Um, a lot of these books that are in, in the stack next to me, you know, were definitely in the last half of the year, if not the last quarter, 
So, you know, I, I'm kind of back into the rhythm yep. of like reading those bigger books. And, you know, there's there's certainly something to be said about a, a shorter book that can grab you and affect you in, in you know, 150 pages or less. Yeah, it's um, impressive, honestly. But, uh, you know, there's there's just something special about getting lost in a, a, a big novel and getting, you know, um, whether it's it's moving you emotionally or provoking thought or you're just swept up in the narrative. Yeah. There's, there's just, you know, a, a special feeling about being really wrapped up in something that, you know, has some weight to it and, mm. you know, um, can be read kind of at length. Yeah, you certainly get some more opportunities to connect with the characters of the world or whatever's going on in the book. One thing you had mentioned earlier about how you had kind of felt like some inertia towards the end to like, yeah. okay, let me like push and, and, and go a little faster. I think that's normal for what we, we, you know, society makes a big deal of new years, right? We all start like we have new year's resolutions right. and for work or family or fitness or whatever. So I think it's kind of normal. Uh, and for me too, I think it is kind of that psychological bit, that line uh, or, or deadline, if you will, where it's like, a good example is I'm I'm currently reading um, the man who fell from grace from the sea by Mishima, uh, and it's it's good, but like I'm like I will finish it today. Right. Tomorrow is January one. I just kind of like it's that mental thing where you're just like, I just I'll finish it today so tomorrow I can just start my new year right with whatever in mind and and it's it's not necessarily to say like i read one more book in 2023 it's just that kind of like mental yeah barrier to st- you know that that line drawn in the sand okay once i cross that line we're starting afresh and and moving forward so yeah. i think that's pretty normal so without further ado let's talk about our top 10 picks for the year you want to hit some of the others when we didn't really talk longest shortest uh, new authors do you want to do that at the end do you want to do that now we'll do it at the end okay. um and so for the t- the the first five in our top 10, or you know, starting with number 10. Um, 10 through 6. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Math is hard, folks. <laughs> um, we'll go back and forth like we normally do, and yep. then I'll just say, like, let's just try to keep it to, like, 60 seconds or less, and then we'll, okay. we'll do a little bit deeper dive on our top fives. All right. Uh, all right, I guess I'll go first. Yeah, go first. Um, I think a handful of these are ones that I've already talked about. Um at least I don't know. Did our uh, like mid-year favorites episode end up getting edited and put out? I don't remember. No. Okay. I, I, it, there was something about it that I was like, I don't love this. Co- I think that was like a three-hour thing. Oh, I know. And we were both kind of just like our low energy, and I was like, this episode <laughs> sucks. Like I wouldn't want to listen to this. So I yeah. just didn't. I didn't okay. really put it together. All right. So I talked about these, but it never made it uh, live. So uh, my first my, number ten, my first pick. Um, is the Netanyahu's by Joshua Cohen? Mm-hmm. Um, just a really interesting book. It is about so Joshua Cohen um, was obviously, obviously a writer. Um, had been in uh, correspondence with Harold Bloom, mm-hmm. and he kind of took an anecdote that Harold Bloom shared with him and turned it into this whole novel. Um, it is about a professor in um, what an outside person might call upstate New York, Mm -hmm. but as the characters in the book are very quick to point out, it is not truly upstate. Um, It's just not New York City. Um, But he's a professor at this small college and um, he's a Jewish historian. And um, I don't remember his first name, but um, the the father of Benjamin Netanyahu was a professor, a writer, Mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and is coming to interview for a position at uh, this university. Mm. And the the protagonist is on the interview board uh, or the review board. And, um, you know, he gets tasked with host, hosting Mr. Netanyahu for his visit. And uh, he shows up with his entire family, oh. his wife, his three kids. Um, and it's just kind of a, a funny little romp there. And... Um, you know, very interesting, a um, lot of introspection and um, really, really deep writing. So cool. cool book. Let me steal this. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to uh, cheat a little bit and we'll <laughs> – 
pulled the book up. So the Save you some editing. Yeah, and for, and for future reference, I'm going to uh, probably not. So <laughs> we'll get a little off track here. Someone had requested that we put subtitles into the YouTube version of these podcasts. And I was like, no problem, because the editing software I use um, auto-generates. Mm-hmm. Uh, the problem is it's not super accurate. And while it's actually not too bad, except when there's multiple speakers, for whatever reason, it really struggles. And I spent about eight hours correcting the subtitles from the Ed Park interview the other day. And I was like, I can't yeah. invest this kind of time anymore. So I am going to auto generate the captions and whatever they are is what they're <laughs> going to be. Um, so I apologize if that was something that you were really enjoying, but I just cannot dedicate that kind of time. I'm going to really turn up the mumbling and see how oh, screwy I can get these captions. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, it, it makes sense that it would struggle because like if two people are kind of talking a little bit over each other, like you're, you're saying something, I'm laughing, whatever. Yeah. But there were some times where it was literally just Ed and not even close to what he said. Not even close. Uh, and so I was just like, I just, I might as well have typed them out from scratch. So yeah. anyway, uh, getting back on track, my Number 10 pick for the year was Inherent Vice by Tommy Ruggles, a.k.a. <laughs> Thomas Pynchon. Uh, this is, as you know, Andy, one of his um, newer novels. And sadly, uh, this will not be an episode where we do not mention Thomas Pynchon <laughs> or Gravity's Rainbow. <laughs> oh. uh, because I did also start Gravity's Rainbow this year, but I have yet to finish it, which I will do. Uh, I wouldn't say I DNF'd it because... I was kind of just doing it a little bit at a time and I was just taking a little bit longer pause. But for me, a true DNF is like, nah. Yeah, like, I was I'm watching out, um, a video on YouTube. I cannot remember the, the guy's name. Um, but he was kind of doing his year-end recap and and he kind of differentiated. He had DNF and then uh, NYF. So he didn't, did not finish or don't finish or whatever. And uh, not, not, yet, finished, not, not yet, yet finished. Not yet, yet, yet finished. And I think... Gravity's Rainbow is one of those books where, like, unless you've read it once before or, you know, really don't have anything else going on in your life, like, mm -hmm. it's hard to just dedicate yeah. a significant or, or a, a set amount of time to finishing it. I mean, the first time I read it, it took me almost four months because I would, you know, read a section and then take, like, a, a week or two off and then go back to it. And, yeah. You know. And I don't necessarily think it, it's bad with a book like that to to kind of take your time with it because there is so much in there. And, you know, like I said, when we kind of started to organize the, the group read, I don't think you need to um, worry about picking everything up your right. first time through. You know, it's going to be multiple reads before you pick most things up. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, if you're just trying to, like, blast through it, It'll still kind of wash over you, but not not the same. Yeah. So anyway, uh, this is one of Pynchon's shorter works at 368-ish pages. Uh, Crying of Lot 49 is it's much shorter. But if you are the type of person who is interested in postmodern literature, and Thomas Pynchon is certainly uh, considered one of the, the godfathers of that genre, uh, and you want to start with kind of a more approachable, less intimidating work, I would say this is probably a great choice. Yeah. Um, I found it very entertaining, very readable, very funny. Um, still has a lot of the themes that Pynchon is known for, but it doesn't have like the convoluted trickery of yeah. lit I, of I would say it is one of, if not his most accessible book. Yeah. And certainly um, a great place for anyone to start. If, if they're looking yeah. to get into his work, I think realistically, if depending on the reader, I would recommend starting with that and then going to um, crying of lot 49. Yeah. Because this is, oh, I'll be a little bit longer than, than lot 49. Like I said, it is, I think more accessible. Uh, yeah. The writing's probably a little more straightforward. And then I think lot 49 is um, kind of a much, it, it's much more succinct, but it really starts to like plant the seed for the ideas that he discusses in his his body of work. Yeah. So. One last bit about this book. I was really attracted to the cover of it with the neon and the, just like the vibe. Yeah. And I do feel 
like the essence of the book matches the cover absolutely very well. Yeah, and it was made into a movie starring Joaquin Phoenix, uh, which was also pretty entertaining. So yeah. Anyway, to your number nine pick. My number nine. We're doing is... a terrible job of these uh, sixty seconds. On these. <laughs> you know, I think we're doing two or three minutes, which is is realistically yeah much more attainable. Yeah. Um, my number nine pick is Angels by yeah. Dennis Johnson. Um, really, I can actually see the monitor oh, here. So perfect. Yeah. Um, <laughs> really interesting book. It's pretty short. It is two hundred fifteen ish pages. Two hundred ten. You you must have read this early on in the year because you've been telling me to to get this book for a while now. Yeah, I, and I, I did think, get a copy. Finally. Yes, I, I want to say I read it. Um, probably would have been like some time in the spring. Yeah, because I read it before Emily and I moved. Um, but it, it, it's about these two people that meet, um, on a, a bus kind of going, not necessarily cross country, but they're going to different States. Um, they're kind of at crossroads in their life and, um, they get separated, you know, they go off and like whatever they were doing and then they end up meeting again. Um, and they just kind of get connected, um, kind of explores the, the darker side of, of life and humanity. Um, it's it's wonderfully written. Um, Dennis Johnson is a, a fantastic writer. So and he, I found out he passed away fairly young. So yeah, uh, which is too bad. This was also um, an underrated favorite of David Foster Wallace's. Oh, very he, cool. He did a. Is that what, how you found out about it? No, mm. no. I think I had seen it. Um, I had heard of it, mm. and then you know I'd seen people speak highly of it, and then I saw this little like article that. Um, someone had shared that that was his like underrated picks or, or underappreciated picks cool. of American fiction, and that was on there, and um, so it really spurred me to read it. But it's a great book. Nice. My number nine pick is not in the stack because it was actually an audiobook. Oh. Uh, I was surprised. I tend to not connect with audiobooks as much as I do when I'm reading. For whatever reason, I just have a harder time paying attention. Uh, fun fact: I was. Uh, diagnosed with adult ADHD this year. And so I just think that for whatever reason, uh, my brain just has a hard time listening. Yeah. Uh, but my number nine pick is uh, King, A Life by Jonathan Eig, the newest uh, Martin Luther King Jr. biography. Um, just a extremely well-researched um, book. The FBI uh, had recently in the last half decade just released a lot of papers um, and documents from, from when they were tracking Martin Luther King Jr. and, you know, the statute of limitations uh -huh. on, you know, how long they can keep it uh, private uh, expired. And so Jonathan Eig was um, probably the first person to read a lot of this stuff. And from that was able to land some interviews with some people that knew King, uh, that you know, he found out about these connections through the through the documents, and um, was able to interview some people before they passed away, uh, because obviously everyone from that era is getting pretty pretty elderly at this point. And uh, despite it being a biography, I thought it was uh, very kind of plot driven. Um, it was it, it didn't read like a list of facts like yeah. a lot of times a biography will for a, a prominent figure like that. Uh, it was just a really entertaining read, and the narration, um, I keep blanking on the guy's name. Uh, I should know it because he also did another book that's in my, in my top ten. Uh, but the narration was fantastic. And I actually learned a lot, not just about Martin Luther King Jr.'s life, but some things about that period in time in American history that don't really get talked about in, you know, traditional American education, you know, certainly K through 12, so... Uh, yeah, it was uh, it was a great book and uh, highly recommended. All right. So to your great. number eight. My number eight pick um, is Libra by... <laughs> I gotcha. Libra by Don DeLillo. Um, it is his kind of uh, JFK novel. Um, it is about Lee Harvey Oswald and... Um, essentially is a, a fictionalized retelling of, excuse me, JFK's assassination and um, kind of a, 
um, theorized um, CIA plot behind it. Um, it's a really interesting take on on history in general, um, kind of the the recording of history. So um, a couple books in your top ten about that. This yeah, year, yeah. Um, but you know, Delillo is a great writer. His what I love about his his writing um, is it's a lot. It's accessible. You know, he definitely discusses some some serious topics and, um, you know, his, his ideas and themes have some, some gravity behind them, but you can also just, you know, kind of read and get, get swept up in the novel. So, um, but really, really interesting book, really, um, good look, uh, at America in that, that time period. Mm -hmm. Um, and also, um, you know, Lee Harvey Oswald as a, a figure of history. Yeah. So cool. My number eight pick was another audiobook. This was the only two in the top 10, uh, but it was The Wager by David Grann. Mm. Uh, interesting. Both those books are audiobooks, and both of them came out in 2023. Um, and uh, that is kind of a random thing to write a book about. It, it's a fairly obscure story about a. Uh, British expedition, uh, ex exploratory expedition in the 1700s. And the ship, uh, you know, gets um, lost to a storm and they end up stranded on an island. And it's just kind of about like what happened to this crew. But David Grand just made it incredibly interesting. Uh, the narration, again, was fantastic doesn't read like again like a list of facts it was just a very kind of narrative driven uh story and supposedly they are going to make that into a movie as well so oh, cool. uh David Grand's Killers of the Flower Moon uh just came out in 2023 uh starring Leonardo DiCaprio and um directed by um Scorsese and supposedly um both of them are going to be involved oh, in cool. the wager so uh, I didn't love Killers of the Flower Moon, the movie. I thought the book was better. Um, so, But I am very interested to see. I actually think the wager as a story will probably be easier to convert to uh, cinema than Killers of the Flower Moon was. Um, but neither you or I read a lot of new releases. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't have a lot to compare it to because I maybe only read five or six books that were released this year. But um, yeah, in general, it was uh, I would I would say that was that's got to be one of the best books of the year just on how good it was. Yeah, so, great. Yeah. All right, uh, my number seven pick <laughs> counting. Yeah, is um, Grimish by Michael Winkler. Yeah, Winkler, uh, Michael Winkler. Um, really interesting, strange, and compelling book. Um, it is about the the kind of it's kind of a frame narrative. So it's a a young man going to meet, um, going to visit his it's either his uncle or grandfather or grand uncle or something, an, an elder yeah. family member, um, and and the I'll just call him his uncle. Um, kind of tells this story about this boxer, Joe Grimm, who was a real person, was a, a real boxer. Um, and he was known for uh, being able to take an absolute pounding. He, <laughs> what, it, what a thing to be known he, for. He had a, a very, um, if you just looked at his win-loss record, you would not be very um, uh, appreciative of it. You know, he, he certainly had quite the losing record. Um, you do not think very highly of him, but he would win crowds over by just getting the absolute bag beaten out of him. Yeah, and would not go down, would not, you know, collapse. He he would stay on his feet, just, just taking this beating, um, and you know would win the crowd over that way. Yeah. Um, and so I, I forget the years to say. Okay, um, from 1908 to 1909, he did a tour of Australia, taking fights in Australia. Um, which is true, but there's not a lot of record yeah. uh, of that year. So that's what the, the, the story is about is his time in Australia during that year. So um, it's very touching, especially the the moments between the, the uncle and the young man, just them kind of talking and, and exchanging stories and things about life. And then also 
um, there's certainly some, you know, moments, uh, um, you know, you think about a guy who kind of makes a, a career out of losing fights in a spectacular fashion. Like yeah. he, he's going to have some emotional moments, um, but also just kind of their, their time on the, the tour is very funny. So nice. Um, it's very, very interesting. Um, definitely a strange book, uh, but really well written and really enjoyable. Yeah, that's that's one that uh, definitely piqued my interest when you were reading it, and I'll probably uh, pick it up sooner than later. Yeah, my number seven pick is "Same Bed, Different Dreams" by Ed Park. If you follow either Andy or I on any of our uh, book related accounts, you will have heard us talking about this book quite a bit. It was another twenty twenty three release, so I guess a couple couple new books in my yeah in my. Uh, Top ten this year, but um, I believe this is also in yours. Yes. Spoiler alert! <laughs> uh, so I won't dig into it too much. I'll just say what I liked about it: uh, in- incredibly unique, uh, very unique narrative structure, um, a wonderful blend of true history, uh, fictionalized history, pop culture. Um, Social critiques, social issues, technology, racism, all kinds of stuff. And if you have not listened to our interview with Ed Park, the author of this book, uh, it is the episode uh, preceding this one. And I just thought he was um, incredibly insightful, Mm -hmm. very kind, uh, very passionate about books. And I thought that one thing, I think more than anything... What stood out to me about that interview was when he said that he loves to talk to people about who have read the book uh-huh. uh, and be very open with them about what the book was about and all that stuff. And and sometimes authors are a little bit like, oh, it's not for me to say. Um, but he really seemed to enjoy that dialogue. Yeah. And one thing he said was in talking to people who have read the book, he starts to learn new things about it. Right. And I think that's really cool. Like sometimes, you know, I think an artist might make a piece of art with something in mind and then you never really know how other people are going to experience it and that can reframe right. um, how you feel. So just a, just a great interview. Um, so thanks to Ed. And uh, we'll go on to your number six. Oh, excuse me. Yes, number six. Number six, I have The Tunnel by William H. Gass. This is such a cool looking book. Yeah. It it really is. You don't um, see a lot of like, like, uh, like black. No books. And honestly. I think it it really is like the perfect cover for mm-hmm. the book. You know, I think we've talked before about how you know obviously you can't judge a book by its cover. Yeah. Um, and I've kind of mocked some social media people who like get super wrapped up and how how good the cover looks but and i've said it as well but i do think or said it before but i do think there's something to be said about a a cover that you know matches the aesthetic of the book yeah um and real quick before i do talk about um the book itself this this edition is actually out of print yeah Um, it has an interesting texture to it as well yeah um Dalkey Archive is going to be republishing it. Oh, cool! As part of their um, Essentials series. Unfortunately, I I love Dalkey Archive. I love their books. I love the, the the way the books look. Everything about their books. Unfortunately, I'm not a big fan of the cover designs of this Essentials series. Oh no! Um, they're all kind of like almost like um, template mm, and, sure. and uniform. They'll kind of look the same. I mean, if you're gonna do like a, a select Which series, I, it kind I, of makes sense. Yeah. I get it's like those orange penguins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it, um, but I don't think, at least with with the tunnel, I don't think the edition that is forthcoming really matches the aesthetic of the book. Gotcha. But anyway, um, very very obviously big physically, but very dense um, and demanding and complex work. Mm. Um, it is about this guy, William Kohler, who was a history professor um, and had spent some time in um, Germany. He teaches a lot about like German history and things like that. Um, and he has written a book called Guilt and, Inner- Guilt and Innocence in Nazi Germany. It's kind of a history book about Nazi Germany. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and kind of what he sets out to do at the start of the novel is just he's finished the the actual like book itself and now he's writing the introduction to it but it ends up kind of him writing about his life his um, colleagues at the university some mm-hmm. mentors of his 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 family his his wife his kids neighbors people in his life um and he's a very spiteful person he does not have a lot of good things to say um about those people with the exception of of one of his mentors mm. um and also at the same time so he he his kind of study that he's you know works in is in his basement um and where the, the book gets it, its title um about halfway through the book he starts to dig a tunnel out of his basement hence the name yeah cool um but very, very interesting book. Like I said, it's it's very demanding and complex. It's certainly one that begs to be reread um, at least once, if not multiple times. Um, but Gas is just such a, a fantastic writer. Um, his, his prose is unbelievable. Mm. Um, he, he spent 26, 26 years writing this book. Holy smokes. Um, I think I read somewhere like he would he would rewrite and edit and revise you know, a single paragraph, you know, like dozens of times. Um, and, and you can really tell the effort that, that went into this book. Yeah. You know, you, you were saying earlier um, with Ed's book, how, you know, he said he, he spent nine years working on it and you can appreciate and, and understand the, the effort that went into that. And you can certainly do the same thing with, with the tunnel. You can really tell it was not something that he just like, you know, worked on a little bit and then put back in a drawer for, 10 years and then yeah. you know it, it was a continuous effort for those two plus decades so yeah and that's something i talked about in the description of that why why are you setting these ridiculously high reading goal that video i posted yesterday it, it there's something to be said about an author that took a quarter of a century to write this book and certainly you're not reading the tunnel in a day right but you might read it over a couple weeks time and then if you're just like tossing it aside and moving on with your life, it's like, man, that's, you're not really doing the artist justice. Um, I know that when you go to a museum and you look at a piece of art, you might not have all day to sit there and think about it, but just, you know, you got to move out of the way, let other people take a look, whatever. But the famous works like the Mona Lisa or, you know, Rembrandt's, uh, the one with the people on the ocean and stuff like that, that those are, uh, uh, paintings that you can like go back to right. and just see little things that you didn't see before. And so with these books where people put all this, uh, effort into, you know, really, I encourage people to like, whether you use Goodreads or you just write in your own journal or whatever, just like write down, yeah. write an essay about the book. Like, right. why not? You know, and uh, I think that's the cool thing about the content creation on the the Bookstagram side of things is like, yeah, I might be making a sixty to ninety second review, which is not that long, but I did sit and think about what did I really like about this book? What didn't I like about it? What's someone going to get out of it? Who might like it? Who might not like it? Yeah. Um, why Why is it important to read or not? Uh, so I'm thinking about all those things and then just trying to condense the essentials into you know, something very digestible. Also very tangential, but <laughs> you know, there's this trend uh, to, to not show the book initially. Right. And it's something I... Uh, didn't do early on and I've switched to doing and a lot of people think, Oh, it's for the algorithm. Right. But here's, here's what's so interesting to me about this is like people, some people complain. They're like, just show the freaking cover. You know, first of all, if you want to say, I don't like that people do that, that's fine. I'm happy to hear people's opinions, but don't tell people how to make their own content. If you don't like it, don't watch. Yeah. You know what I mean? Point blank. Um, there's some creators that I don't like the way they do things, so I don't watch their stuff. I don't go on their page and say, you suck because you do it this way. Right. You know, people are entitled to to create however they want. But one thing I have noticed is, uh, you know, it, if you are just wanting to see the cover and you don't care about what I'm saying beforehand, then do you really care about the book? Right. Like, you, you, all you care about is to say, oh, I've read that or not. Right. It's like... 
if I if I'm for 20 to 30 seconds holding a book like this and telling you about it, just listen to what I am saying. Yeah. And decide based on that if it's a book you would be interested in. I'm not really sure what seeing the cover or the title is going to do for you or change how what I'm saying matters. Yeah. Um so I just think <laughs> I just think that's kind of interesting and it's like dude, this book is going to take you you know, a book like The Tunnel, how long did that take you to read? Mm, like six to eight weeks. Right. Something it, like that. It's like you, you can't wait 30 seconds right. to find out what the title of this book yeah. is, you know? So Yeah, it, it's it's similar to Gravity's Rainbow. It's not a book. Like I said, you're, you're going to need to read it multiple times to really get yeah. um, a, a deeper understanding and appreciation for it. But it's, again, the same thing. Like if you're just kind of reading it the first time to – experience it as it is yeah it's not something that you know it would recommend reading in you know two weeks right it's, it's not even something that i would recommend you know if you have if you have two hours to read um i wouldn't even recommend spending a full two hours on it you know there were times right, right. where and you know it certainly as i got a little bit deeper into the book and had um, yeah, you get the author's better. rhythm a little right. more, and a little bit yeah. more rhythm and understanding. Like you can definitely read it for longer lengths, but especially within the first like hundred, hundred fifty pages, like I might get 10, 15 pages and be like, "I'm good. I got, I got it for the day." And and um, you know, Gas has has gone on record and, and said something along that um, along those lines about how like this, his first hundred pages, like he's testing you. Yeah, like. Kind of testing you to see, like, okay, can you hang with me? Right, you know. So you you do have to to put in some work to get it, and and imagine you, like trying to take all of that and stuff it into sixty seconds, a sixty second review. Yeah, and so that's you know, as a content creator, I'm always trying to do the author justice, and I think the video I did about the bridge at No Gun Re is a great example of. Uh, not only is that a very kind of niche, uh, the Korean War is called the Forgotten War. So that as a broad subject is not popular. And then the Bridget No Gun Ri is about one event that right. happened in the Korean War. And the book is 23 years old or 20, yeah, 23 years old. And it came out September 6th, 2001. And so a few, five days after this book <laughs> comes out, 9-11 happens. Nobody wants to read a book about a small event. Or it's not small, but obscure event in the Korean War, which no one cared about anyway. And all of the book tours, everything was canceled because the country went into lockdown, blah, 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 blah. And it's like that video got 130-something thousand views, 160,000 views. A lot of people said, wow, this is sounds great. I'm going to go pick it up. And it's like, if I had started that video and said, here's the Bridget No Gun Re. It's about, you know, the Korean War, uh, this massacre that happened. I don't think that video would have performed as well. People right. were like, eh, not really into that topic yeah. and moved on. But I created a little anticipation, kind of hyped it up. And then people, I sold you on it. And then now people are interested. So it's like. You know, you, you these books, the tunnel, gravity's rainbow, or maybe like a really uh, niche nonfiction that's still important for people to read. Like, it's so hard to condense them into yeah. these little fragments. Um, so, uh, anyway, we'll I'll get off that tangent. I will show you my number six <laughs> pick, which is uh, the first book I would read this year in 2023, oh, wow. which is uh, 100 Years of Solitude. Uh, seems so far away now. Um, I vividly remember reading it. I don't need to go into too much about this book. If you haven't heard of it, I don't, I don't know <laughs> what you've been doing. Um, obviously what probably, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez's most famous work, I would say. Um, I had not previously read a lot of South American literature. I checked off a few countries from Latin America this year in my reading journey. And I think this was also probably the first uh, book of magical realism, which I was very skeptical about whether or not I would like that. Uh, and I ended up really enjoying it. As someone who 
used to read a lot of nonfiction and still reads a, a good amount. Uh, I always kind of had the sentiment like truth is scarier than fiction. Um, and so that's why I was like, Oh, magical realism. It sounds a little cartoonish. Yeah. Uh, but it's, yeah, I don't know. He's just a master of his craft. I really enjoyed it. Um, and, and looking forward to reading, not just more from Marquez, but more in that genre, which there's a book in both of our top tens that, uh, I guess you could call magical realism to an extent. Yeah. Um, so anyway, on to our top five. I guess the whole 60-second thing was fake, so we'll just keep doing what we've been <laughs> doing here. Uh, what is your top five pick? My number five pick is Pay As You Go by Escort David Johnson. Fantastic. Um, really just wonderful novel. Uh, hopefully, if you're listening to this, you have listened to our interview with Esker, um, which was another great one, similar to Ed. He's just very open. Yeah, and, lovely uh, guy. Love, Lovely guy, great talking to him in general, mm-hmm. um, but also was just very open and and um, willing to talk about not just the book, but his kind of process and his influences behind it and, and all that stuff. So, um, but yeah, it's just a really, really fun, interesting novel. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, I, I've said this before, but I really enjoy books where like you can read them and enjoy the narrative and leave it at that, but also you can, you can read between the lines yeah, and really think about the book and the ideas that are behind it. And I think this is a perfect um, book for something like that, uh, especially, a, you know, a, a newer, not just new, but like brand new um, modern release where um, it's just a fun story, but there's also a lot of depth to it. So, um, yeah, it's a very, it's, it's, it's a well-balanced book. I yes. think the writing is entertaining. It has certainly some page, some page turning elements to it, despite it not being like a high flying action type of book. Right. Uh, but you are very vested in the characters and wanting to know how things are going to play out. Yeah. Um, there are some deeper themes about, I guess you could say the housing crisis, right. <laughs> if you will. Uh, maybe how, less fortunate people are treated. Um, there's certainly some themes about how people treat others when they're maybe desperate or in need of, you know, something uh, and how people take advantage of one another. But on its surface, it is kind of like a fun, lighthearted, almost cartoonish. Yeah. Like I think, I think if this were made into a film, I, would, I think it would work as a animated. Absolutely. Um, I think it would be really cool that way. It's something we didn't ask Escor about, which we probably <laughs> should have. I'd be curious to hear his thoughts on that. But uh, I really loved it. And um, he is just kind of a low-key genius, I think. <laughs> he, he's such a smart and talented guy, but he's not flashy. He's very unassuming. He's unassuming. I think it's a good way to put it. Uh, so for those that have listened to the interview, you will know that his father is a uh, professor of history. I actually was able to find some lectures and and whatnot from his father. Uh, And I, I just can't imagine like growing up in a household (laughs) with that guy. Like he just, that guy just seems like a genius. And that's clearly uh, obviously, I think when you grow up in a household with, with people like that, it probably sets a little bit of a higher bar in terms of education. Yep. You know, Escor did his undergrad at Harvard, which is, you know, impressive just to get into that school and then went to the Iowa uh, writers MFA program, which is, you know, pretty elite. Um, so he has a, a very impressive resume and the talent is clear on the pages, but it's, it, Nothing about his writing is like egotistical no. or uh, someone had commented about um, Don DeLillo on one of my videos saying, you know, he's a writer's writer or I, I hope he's not a writer's writer. Right. Kind of meaning like th- there's a little like pompousness or, you know, hoity toity. Yeah. Like, and despite how smart and, and uh, a high achieving Escort is. Uh, you don't get that sense in the writing. No, um, it's a very down to earth book. It's very down to earth. Yeah, yeah. So. I, you know, I I said it in the interview. Um, I think there's there's a lot of of moments um, within the book, even if the 
experience is not familiar to the reader. The the emotion and the, the feeling yeah. during those experiences are, are very familiar to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, so, but you know, it's, it, it's great. It's, it's funny. It's witty, yep. uh, charming, thoughtful. It, I could go on and on with, with superlatives, but. And I think it would work as a, as a film. Absolutely. You know, it, it there's a couple of things that would, you would probably want to take out as, as happens most times when, when, uh, books are turned into movies, but I think it would work well. Definitely. So, all right, um, my number five pick is is something that I read, we, we both read pretty recently, mm. which is Love and Terror by William Herrick. And this book is um, very interesting because I really did not like it the first 20 or 30 pages. I think I messaged you and was like, this is just seems like trashy, like pop. I think you said it kind of reminded you of like an 80s B movie. Yeah, and it definitely has that vibe. Uh, but William Herrick won me over, and he's a, a bit of a obscure uh, or maybe forgotten author. He was known as the American George Orwell, which I thought was interesting. And uh, this book is about two um, college-aged uh, people who kind of fall into political extremism and literally become terrorists. Uh, violent terrorists. Yes. And what I loved about the book is that it does kind of start off like cheesy. There's some sex scenes. The violence is a little kind of cheesy or goofy. And it really becomes a, a, a critique of how faulty any extreme ideology is and how it kind of will eventually always collapse on itself. Yes. Uh, no matter what you believe. And I think Herrick did a really good job of like that theme kind of sneaking up on you because you can read this book. It's just like a action packed. It does start off very campy. Yes. Campy is a great way to explain it. Yes. And it, it you can read it as like a, Oh, it's just like a, a, a action novel. Right. It's like young, good looking people, you know, doing violence and, and having sex and rock and roll. Right. Um, but there is certainly a much uh, more important theme underlying all of that. Yeah. And also, uh, I don't want to spoil it, but there are some characters in this book that are essentially the older and wiser version of the two protagon main protagonists. Yeah. And some of the chapters are told from their perspective and that juxtaposition really worked well for me. Yeah. Um, and so I reading it, I, I, I really enjoyed it. By the time I was done, I was like, wow, this was great. And I wasn't really thinking it would be in my top 10. Uh, but when I sat down last night to really like look at everything I had read, I was like, you know what? I, I really like jived with this book. So. Yeah. I, I echoed a lot of the same thoughts that you have on it. I think, Maybe in a different year. Um, by sure, our, yeah. You know, it, it certainly. It's all relative. Know, it didn't, yeah. you know, didn't crack my top ten, but it certainly was was high up on the the list of books I read this year. Um, yeah, the, everything you said, I agree with. It, it started off very just kind of like narrative driven, kind of a I want to say fun story because how fun is terrorism? But like, <laughs> right. you know, it, like you said, kind of, or like you said, kind of a campy action movie. But it, he really does get into the um, the dangerous attraction of idealism yeah. Yeah. and and radicalism. Um, you know, I was just thinking about again without spoiling anything. There's there's that one character who has kind of a very hard more. He he participates in the um, radicalism, but has some very hard lines on what he will and won't do. Yeah, and then as soon as that switch gets flipped, he's a totally different character. Yeah. He's he's all in on on everything, and I think, well, he's not the protagonist, one of the protagonists. His his arc is a really very clear example of of what the novel is about. Yeah, I agree. And just one more thing about that kind of concept. Also, there's uh, they they start out with one kind of stated enemy, and then. Uh, then they eventually go after a group that's typically considered a victim of society because they they are so di you know, disillusioned with modern society that 
well, if, if this group is as a victim as the status quo, then we need to break the status quo and then go after them. And then, then you start to realize like, okay, this whole thing is kind of bullshit. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like you guys are just out of your minds. Yeah. So, um, I did a little bit of research. I don't think any of the events depicted in the book are based in any type of reality, but it's just, uh, it's borders kind of a historical fiction because I think some of the notions uh, have certainly played out in real life mm-hmm. uh, and certain movements throughout, you know, the sixties and seventies and whatnot. But um, yeah, cool book. Um, first time I'd ever read any Herrick and now uh, I put his, uh, his memoir on my, uh, or biography on, on my list. So oh, cool. Uh, number four yeah. for you. All right. My number four pick is Troll by David Fitz, uh, Dave Fitzgerald. This is a 2023 release, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. By uh, Whiskey Tit Books. Whiskey Tit. Yeah. Okay. Their, their logo, you can see it on the spine, is uh, pretty cool. It's uh, <laughs> All right. provocative, yeah. to say the least. Um, Independent publisher, I believe. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Small press. Um, really interesting novel. Um, it is basically about um an an internet troll yep cool um kind of uh not necessarily glorifying um kind of falling into that like internet troll lifestyle Mm -hmm. but more so an examination of how easy it is to fall into that sure um kind of idealism uh one thing that's very interesting about the book it is all told from the second person so yeah, that's very, an interesting, uh, very interesting and, and pointed stylistic choice. You know, you a, at times really feel like you could be yeah. the character. Um, I, when you told me that I was like, I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that's told from the second person. Perspective. I've, I've heard of other books that yeah. maybe if not necessarily the whole book, but like parts of the book or a lot um, of it's, uh, uh, by default of that is present tense, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've certainly heard of novels that are like that, but yeah. this is the, the first and only one that I have uh, read. But yeah, it, very interesting. Um, it's a funny novel. It's it's very serious, but it also is is very funny and witting, yeah. witty. Um, it's funny. I kind of read it, not necessarily like in concert with the tunnel, but around the same time and there was definitely some overlap between the two um and it's 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 funny because they're both the the protagonist in both is is very spiteful and kind of has this negative outlook Mm -hmm. on life but troll is definitely a funnier novel Mm. um the the way he winds up in some of some of the situations or kind of um how he gets pushed deeper and deeper into this like almost quote um you know insult dumb yeah it is very funny but um you know one of the things that that really stood out to me and kind of one of my biggest takeaways like i said um when i first put it up is just how easy it is to get kind of sucked in to that like i'm just gonna be a loner at home and yeah hate everything and um you know the 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 character has a couple of experiences that i think would be very familiar to any young man in the you know last 5 10 15 yeah. years yeah. you know he has you know he there's there's one section where he, he meets a girl they kind of hit it off they go on a date it goes poorly he kind of puts his foot in his mouth she doesn't like him. She doesn't want to see him again. Um, And he responds pretty poorly Mm -hmm. to it. Um, And I think, you know, like I said, like any, any young man that has, has tried to, to date in the last five, 10 years is probably, I'm sure longer than that, but um, has run into that experience where you kind of feel like you're hitting it off and then it just fizzles out and doesn't go anywhere. And, maybe you try to get that spark back and it's a pretty um fruitless effort yeah um so hopefully the the reaction to that situation is not common and familiar yeah but i'm sure the the situation itself is is one that um 
people will will know about. But um, obviously, a lot of character study. There's also a lot of um, kind of studies or ex- examination of like pop culture. Yeah, um, and kind of how pop culture can also kind of contribute to that state of mind. <clears throat> I have not read Troll, but I, based on what you've told me about it, I do think novels like that are very important. And it's kind of a shame that, you know, it's probably not going to be that popular of a book. Right. But there's certainly a generational sentiment that we've all experienced of words don't matter and, you know, what don't be offended by words, don't be hurt by words which is extremely ignorant. Um, you know, if words don't matter, then why do you watch the news? Right. <laughs> why, do, why do you read books? Why do you read magazines or newspapers? Uh, but I think that it's difficult for older generations to appreciate the fact that young people are growing up and this is the only world they've ever known. Right. I, you, you are a little bit younger than me. I barely remember the the world before the internet. So if you've been born into this world and like, look, if you, if you were born in the two thousands, you, you could be old enough to vote and drink and right. You know what I mean? Like you, you are an adult now. Right. I remember the year 2000 quite, quite well. And I remember when YouTube became a thing and Facebook, I remember when Facebook you could only sign up if you had a college email address. It was only for college students. You know, I remember these events. Yeah. And so if you've grown up in this world where social media is the norm, then what you see and experience on social media is extremely real for you. And there's a lot of trickery. Uh, there's a great uh, channel that I follow. His name is Goob U, Goob U2 or something like that. He's a fitness guy. And he basically just calls out people who doctor their photos. Uh And so he'll, you know, uh, zoom in on a photo and show where you can see that someone made their waist look smaller or their butt look bigger. And look, I'm a guy that has experience in photography and videography and editing. And some of this stuff, I'm like, wow, I, I didn't even catch that. You know, this guy's got a good eye. Yeah. And so, you know, your, your reality is being warped. Uh, as far as um, what's real and what's not. And going back to what you mentioned, like dating in the modern era, um, there's a phenomenon in nutrition called the buffet effect, which is uh, if you, you have more options, uh, you will you will eat more uh-huh. and you will overeat and you will um, overindulge. And I think that's kind of like – similar to the dating world is you get on these apps, even if it's just Instagram, like Instagram is almost a dating app to a degree, right? You kind of have this sentiment like there's always something better. There's always the next one. And, oh, I didn't like this one little detail about this person, so I'm just going to ghost them. Um, And I think that goes both ways for for men, women, uh, everybody. And But I do think it is more common for men to – uh, be like emotionally damaged by it. And so I'm not trying to justify anyone's behavior, but I do think it's very common for men to get rejected and then lash out. Which is exactly what, which is exact what that book's about, right? Yeah. From what you've told me. So I do think that's an important book if that's kind of like putting that concept under the microscope. Um, but people definitely need to take a better... Uh, take better responsibility for their emotions and their actions. And it's funny because I coach other people on, um, on content creation as part of my, my business. Um, and so many people are afraid to put their face on yeah. the internet. And I will tell you that for sure, no matter who you are or what, you are saying or making content about you will get nasty, mean, unsolicited comments. Yeah. And you just have to realize that those people on the whole are probably just emotionally scarred in some way and are just lashing out because, because they're hurt. You know what I mean? And so, um, and for me, I'm very good at like not caring and also, I love 
I, I'm just very <laughs> confrontational, so I just love to clap back at people. But that's not everyone's personality. And some people don't, you know, aren't able to do that or don't want to do that. So, uh, but you just have to just realize that that's kind of the world we're living in. And yeah, I don't know what the solution is, but I, I think that book is probably, uh, you know, prescient. So. It's very astute. I don't want to do. I'm trying to avoid doing the lazy. Um, book influencer thing and just read the the blurb or the synopsis but uh the blurb on the cover describes it as fight club for the twitter generation (laughs) and that's that's just perfect yeah you know i think the a book like this that's going to get in the wrong reader's hand and is good that person's going to read it and be like oh this this guy is yeah he's great he's awesome this is what i would do Uh, similar i don't i'm hoping that he's vile enough that he won't get this the the tyler durden treatment and be um you know revered right become like a martyr right yeah. but you or, know or uh, american psycho yes <laughs> but you know i definitely think that the wrong person could read this and and interpret it very incorrectly yeah but you know i think um like i said it, it's very astute the 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 right reader is going to understand what fitzgerald is getting at and it's um, certainly a, a fantastic novel and, um, you know, we've, we've poo pooed, uh, modern fiction quite a bit here, but, uh, you know, books like this and some of the others that we've already talked about, you know, give me, me hope for yeah. the future. Yeah. And we are doing our part by promoting these lesser known works. So I'll pat myself on the back for that. Yeah. So number four for me is uh, another book we both read this year. Um, the sympathizer, uh, by uh, Viet Thanh Nguyen. Uh, he is a Vietnamese American author. This is about a communist spy during the Vietnam War. He's uh, fighting for the um, uh, North Vietnamese, but he's undercover uh, acting as um, a military uh, officer in the South Vietnamese Army and then the fall of Saigon, and he gets. Uh, uh, sent over to the States and um, <clears throat> unique story. Like everyone knows about the Vietnam war, but not everyone really knows about like what it was like to, um, you know, have to become a refugee mm-hmm. uh, in America for the, some of the South Vietnamese and also just told from an interesting perspective because this guy has communist ideals and values, right. but he's like having to pretend like he doesn't. Um, so I just thought it was well-written unique i mean it won the pulitzer prize which doesn't guarantee a book is good but you know pretty good chance it's not going to (laughs) suck um i really enjoyed it when i read it but i didn't feel like i loved it but then again like sitting down really thinking about what i read and and this is a book that i kind of continue to think about and Uh maybe it's because we did like an episode on it but i I just think it was uh unique uh the writing was good and um yeah it compelled me enough to pick up the sequel, yeah. uh, which I plan on reading in 2024. So, I mean, I don't have a ton to say about it, even though it's in my top five. Uh, just just like a solid, unique book. And I'm glad that works of fiction like this are winning Pulitzer Prizes mm-hmm. and these kind of notable awards because sometimes you, you feel like it's just a little bit of a popularity contest. And I, I think this is a book that a lot of, for as popular as it is, I think a lot of people would read it and be like, this is way out of left field for me, you know, like, holy smokes. And so it's good that, that books that are kind of challenging, maybe, uh, people who read more popular works. I think it's good to challenge groups like that. So, yeah, I would say the same thing, you know, when I, or had probably had a similar reaction to you, like when I read it, I was definitely enjoying it. And when I finished it, I thought it was a, a really good, solid book, but it wasn't anything that like, blew me away well i mean you had 80 some odd more books to choose from for your top <laughs> um, <10. laughs> but then when we you know sat down and talked about it for the episode we did it it really kind of grew on me you know that that left it with like a, a much more um favorable impression not to, not to say that like i didn't like it going into that and it but you know i certainly took away more appreciation for it and well yeah i mean it's like i think we had said like oh we don't know if we can fill a whole episode and then we did right uh just talking about this book and so that's again not to hammer this uh, or beat a dead horse here but that's kind of like the point of taking your time with books right is then you start to be like you know what there's more here than maybe i initially thought right 
So. Yeah, yeah, definitely a really interesting, solid, well written book. Um, like you said, very unique narrative. So yeah. I would recommend it. And I also picked up um, a copy of the sequel. Yeah, um, the committed, I believe it is. Yes. Yeah. TBD if I get to it in 2024, <laughs> but I will definitely read it in the future. Cool. All right. You are number three. We're getting serious. Oh, here. yeah. Now we're getting into it. So my number three pick is the uh, big red one. The big red one. Baron Van Kimes Homecoming by Laszlo Krasnohorkai. Um, I've read a number of his his books. I think this was my seventh book. Yeah. Yes. Seventh um, book of his that cool. I've read. Um, I almost would say it was like my favorite of his, which might be a little bit of recency bias, but, you know, definitely top two or three mm-hmm. out of those seven. Um very interesting story. So the the title character, Baron Van Kheim, um, is actually living in Argentina. Mm. Um, not too much of his time there is, is told, you know, or as part of the narrative. You get some um, information about it, but essentially he has racked up quite the gambling debt in um, uh, Argentina. He's, he's kind of like, a, I haven't read... Um, Dostoevsky's the idiot, but he's been kind of compared to that Prince Mishkin character, just cool. kind of a, you know, sort of dopey baron, mm-hmm. you know, who has this this elevated societal status, but, you know, isn't really this elevated person. Sure. Um, so to risk further or to um, limit further disparagement of the family name. They sent him back to their hometown in um, Hungary. Mm-hmm. Um, and Which is where Krasnohorka is from, right? Yes. He's a Hungarian author. Yeah. Yes. Um, and, and you know, the townspeople get word of it and they all kind of are operating under the assumption that this baron is coming back to save the, the town mm. and, you know, kind of lift them up out of the... Um, kind of lower state that they're in and, and kind of lift them up. And um, without really spoiling anything in the book, that's not what happens. <laughs> um, Fair enough. But, you know, it, it's this this darkly comic novel. You know, they all are, like I said, kind of expecting him to be their savior um, and are acting accordingly. And when things don't really go according to plan, like it, you know, kind of shakes out and they – it's it's tragic, but it's it's almost kind of like I said, kind of funny yeah. the way it, it happens. Um, Krasno Horkai is such a a, a fantastic author. Mm. I've, I've talked before about the his books all kind of have this suspense to them, and and the style he writes in where it's this just kind of long, um, ongoing sentences that you know go for pages at a time without any real interruption really kind of blends to that because you're just it, it's just kind of building up. And building up and building up, yeah. and, and the tension really um, gets elevated. And he's such a, a, a fantastic author. I, I know I marked stuff in this book, but I, I guess I didn't have sticky notes handy. Um, but you know, it's very, <clears throat> very interesting. There's some very um, kind of weird and quirky um, side narratives that really add to the the overall theme of the book. Yeah. Um, so obviously, obviously, there's a lot about the Baron himself, but there's also this professor that lives in town, um, really highly regarded for his level of intelligence. Um, and at some point prior to the the narrative of the book starting, um, he decides to kind of throw it all away mm. and go kind of live in extreme isolation. And um, is this the precursor to troll? <laughs> <laughs> um, and also, so his goal for um, um, going into isolation is to get rid of the need for thought. Like he doesn't oh, wow. want to like think okay. anymore. He just kind of wants to exist. Um, so he's this very, you know, hermetic character. Um, there's this like biker gang in town that has this kind of... Um, high reverence for him and some of the other characters. And it's, you know, like I said, very 
it's, it's very funny. It's, it's funny. It's, it's very interesting. Um, you know, kind of mystical in a sense. Yeah. So, um, I don't know if I would recommend it for anyone getting into Krasna Horkai's work. You know, I, th- I think I, um, mentioned this before on the show, but he, he's a Krasna Horkai has written many books, but he kind of considers, um, Satan Tango, Melancholy of Resistance, War and War, and and this Baron Venkheim's Homecoming as kind of one yeah. Uber novel. Yeah. With this being the um final stage mm-hmm. in the tetralogy. So for that reason alone, I wouldn't really yeah. recommend starting here. But also I think, you know, you'll just have a a deeper understanding and appreciation of his his ideals and some of the themes he approaches in his work. Yeah. That you know, you'd be better better off saving this for the end. Cool. Fantastic. My number three pick couldn't be any different from uh any more any more different from yours, <laughs> which is uh uh this other Eden oh, by that. Awesome. Paul Harding. Yeah, I I literally read this this week and I felt a little conflicted about putting it so high in my top ten because you would think, oh, like recency bias. But to be honest, it is just such a fantastic novel. So this is the second Paul Harding I've read. Mm-hmm. I read Tankers many years ago, which won the Pulitzer Prize, which was his debut novel. So again, uh, you know, probably off to a good, 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 good start. <laughs> um, and I am confident in saying that Paul Harding is, I could put it one of two ways. He, you could either say he's New England's John Steinbeck or he's this generation's John Steinbeck. Ooh. And the reason why I say that is uh, I think the, the writing is somewhat similar. I don't have any formal education in uh, critiquing literature, so maybe somebody who does would, would say I'm way off base with that uh, and could get into the nuts and bolts of why. But I think the things they have in common are they write uh, they write about a lot of kind of turn of the century um, you know, 19, early 1900s type topics. Mm-hmm. Uh, they both write about somewhat downtrodden people, but they also have this thing, both Steinbeck and Harding have this thing they do, uh, and this is what I alluded to earlier, about there's beautiful pieces of writing here that are not necessarily pertinent to driving the narrative forward or explaining something about a particular character. So... I think Steinbeck and Harding are both extremely poetic in their world building and taking kind of small details and making them just seem very vivid. Uh And uh, so that's kind of why I feel like he's very similar to Steinbeck in that way. And so he wrote Tinker's. Uh, which takes place in New England. His second book, which I've not read, is called Ennin. That's about a town in Massachusetts. And this other Eden is about um, an island in Maine. Mm-hmm. I read this right after finishing Love and Terror by William Herrick. So I put t- two books in my top five I read recently. But I had a very hard time getting into this because the pacing is much slower. And mm-hmm. it was really... Uh, difficult after reading more of a high paced novel like love and terror, but I didn't want to, that was more of like a, my fault thing. And not necessarily if I wouldn't say like this, this book drags on. In fact, I would say my biggest critique of this book is that it could have been longer. Um, And so not just because um, I'm, you want to know what happens to the characters, but just because the writing is so good. And there were some times, multiple times where I literally just reread, you know, two or three pages. I would just go back and reread them just because the writing is just mind blowingly good. Um, and so, yeah, it's crazy that this is top three because I literally just finished it, but uh, he's incredible. I, I enjoyed this more than tinkers, I think. And, uh, this is a historical fiction, I would say. Um, it's based on a real event, but I believe um, everything, the names and, and everything in the book are, are fictionalized. Mm-hmm. So um, really sad story, really brutal. And 
that's another reason why I think he's similar to Steinbeck is he's not afraid to just be like, yeah, this doesn't have a happy ending. Sorry. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So uh, if you haven't read any Harding, check him out if you're in the literature, because I think he's uh, he's one of those guys that in 10, 15 years, you know, is going to be like it's going to be all the stuff will be considered classics, I think. All right. So well, I will definitely have to get around to my copy of Tinker's. All right, we're into the top two. Yeah, I, I don't, I didn't struggle, but with the top two, like I kind of went back and forth with what was going to be one, what was going to be two. Yeah. Um, and I made my decision, and I think with with my number two pick, when I finished it, I I was like, this is going to be number probably going to be my number one, yeah. and then I ended up I ended up getting usurped, um, with a with a book I read shortly after finishing it, but. Without further ado, my number two pick is Same Bed, Different Dreams by <clears throat> Ed Park. Yep. Um, I mean, we've talked about it at length both today. Uh, we did an episode on it. We did an interview with Ed. Yes. I don't want to. We are being paid handsomely, by the way. <laughs> um, I wish. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we could keep talking about this book, but I kind of would just be saying the same thing sure. I have said over and over. Um, just a really compelling narrative, very interesting in the the narrative structure of it. Yep. Um the the writing is is great, but it's also very accessible. Yep. You know, you're not Agreed. going to be bogged down and and miss any of the the narrative points because of how it's written. Much like inherent vice, which we talked about earlier, if you're looking for an introduction to the cool Postmodern literature world. Yeah. Uh, same bad, different dreams is not a bad pick. Yeah. But I think, you know, it's, it's like you said, it's very um, prescient in, in pop culture. Yep. You know, the way he talks about history. I, I said um, in our episode on it and our interview with Ed that it did remind me a lot of Libra, which is also on my list. Um, yep. I think what really made this stand out to me. Um, over Libra is um, this felt same by different dreams felt a little bit larger in scope. Mm. It's a lot more encyclopedic yeah. in the, the number of characters, um, the, the interweaving narratives, how the narratives are told and how everything kind of comes together. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's just a really astute and, and interesting um observation and, and study of of history cool so definitely a great book um it has been really i'm trying to make sure i'm not like covering my I face with the stack um you know i i uh have seen a lot of people um it, both have gotten messages and just seen kind of people share posts about how like they've read this recently or it is high up on their list of books to read in um 2024 mm. and it, it's just been really cool to see kind of like what i said earlier about um troll and pay as you go um kind of seeing quality literature yeah. kind of carry on in, in modern releases and yeah. it's it's really awesome to see um more great readers showing interest in this wonderful novel Absolutely. And ironically, and, and Andy and I did not plan this, uh, my number two pick is Pay As You Go <laughs> by uh, Escort David Johnson. And as such, because we've also talked about this at length, we can kind of just kind of breeze through our number two picks. Um, I mean, they're both deserving of uh, quite a bit of discussion, but uh, everything I think I, I have to say about this book has been said on the internet already. And so um, if you haven't read Pay as you go or say in bed different dreams. I think both books can be appreciated by a wide range of readers. Uh, yeah, if, definitely. You, if you are a strict, um, you know, fantasy or romance reader, maybe not. But um, if you dabble a little bit in literature and maybe some modern stuff and some classics, or you like, uh, you know, impactful nonfiction, I think, uh, you know, uh, I think most people would enjoy both of these books for different reasons. Yeah. So, um, have we picked a winner yet? 
No, we'll get to that. I'll, I'm going to do that in a little short video. That okay. Whole thing. Someone, someone's winning a free copy of this. Uh, <laughs> I have an extra copy in yeah. my library, and someone's going to get it. Yeah, so. we're, we're going to uh, announce, I'll, I'll announce that uh, this first week of January here. So without further ado, your number one pick for 2023 out of the 119 books that you read. My number one pick is J.R. by William Gaddis. And so that's... Uh, no, this is the only Gaddis on your. The other one's Gas, right? You have a William yes, Gas. And- yes, this is the only Gaddis yeah, that gotcha. I read this year. Um, I think I read one of Gas's like short stories or something. Um, I have, I have Gas's uh, Reader, which is like a you know compendium of yep. selections of, of works of his um, essays, short stories, and excerpts from his novels. Um, I just picked one of the the short stories out of there. Um, but yeah, anyway, J.R. William Gaddis, fantastic fucking novel. Um, it's an absolute circus of a novel. Um, you know, I was thinking about it on my way over here. At a glance, this this novel should not have worked. You know, if if you kind of think about it, like it almost doesn't make sense mm. that it was as successful. Not not anything to do with the the quality, but it's. It's 720 something pages without any breaks. It's entirely uninterrupted mm-hmm. and it is almost entirely unattributed dialogue. <laughs> like just structurally yeah. looking at it, like, yeah, how do you make that? That's a hard you, sell. How, right. Um, but it's, it's just such a compelling novel and, and narrative and Gaddis is such a great writer. Yeah. Um, you know, he did such a great job coming up with distinct voices for, for every character, you know, once you get to a certain point, um, you can pick up the rhythm and it's, it's usually, I don't say easy, but it's, it's not too difficult to figure out which character is speaking. Yeah. You know, they, like I said, they all have their own distinct voice and, and mannerisms. Um, and what's, what's, what's great about it, you know, um, Gaddis is often looked at as this, um, you know, very erudite intellectual author. Um, you know, a lot, lots of allusions to and references to to higher art and things like that, mm-hmm. which you know certainly takes place. And in, in, in certain instances in this book, definitely a lot more so in um, his book, the the recognitions, mm-hmm. which is all about like high art. So it, it kind of makes a lot of sense there. Um, but for someone that kind of is known for that and has that sort of style, there's not, there's not a lot of like forced diction, Mm. you know, the, the characters all speak like, you know, normal people do. Yeah. You know, there's certainly a couple of characters who are more the, the artistic type that kind of have that, that kind of flair and Mm. sensibility about them. But you know, no one's kind of speaking in this like highfalutin, pompous way where, you know, they're using all sorts of like, you know, $10 words and you have to stop and look up everything they're saying. Yeah. To, you know, it, it, there are certainly characters that, that are pompous and have this kind of air about them, but, you know, th- they're written with that intention of like fitting that, that personality trait. But, um, you know, like I, w- I, I kind of said about um, Same Bad, it's a very encyclopedic novel. Mm-hmm. Um, I kind of alluded the, to this in our interview with Ed because he is such a fan of um, Gaddis. One of the things I just love about his work is the way he'll kind of set something up and put a character in a situation kind of talking about something that they're about to go do or whatever, and then he'll totally go off onto another section of the narrative, and then a little bit later you'll get like, a couple of sentences that'll just kind of like explain the the fate of that earlier character and like what happened to them. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just this kind of like domino effect. Um, but you, you know, really, really fascinating book. Um, I haven't really talked about the plot. It's, it's all about, so JR is the, the title character. Um, he is a sixth grade boy who, basically starts a, um, a a corporate empire just 
he he starts off kind of like responding to like almost like get rich quick schemes that you would get in the mail and mm-hmm. like penny stocks and things like that and just kind of turns it into like this almost like pump and dump scheme of just like acquiring one business and leveraging their assets to get another and th- and and all kind of building and it's all on paper like they don't have a a physical like address yeah you know, the business when, when does this take place the 70s uh it was published in 65 okay um i believe it's like in the 50s and 60s okay yeah so um basically that that generation's version of like uh drop shippers or uh, exactly like, crypto and like bros. day trading and things yeah. like that yeah, yeah yeah so um and you know he, he starts to kind of like build a name for himself in this you know kind of corporate world and everyone everyone wants to like know more about the business and about him and all that. And he's just like operating out of a um, payphone that he managed to have put up in the school. And like, you know, the, the business address is like this one guy's apartment yeah. and um, their, their headquarters are like a hotel suite. That's and actually it, sounds hilarious. So it's, it's a very funny book, you yeah. know um, there are, are plenty of, of moments that, you know, you can laugh out loud at, um, but it's also just like very, very prescient in the way that you know one of the 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 things about the style is it's not just a stream of conscious it's just streams of consciousness you know yeah. there's there's multiple voices and um going on at once and just like a constant influx of of information mm. um and there were there were so many times where i would be you know during and after reading it where i like i'd be at work and I'd be talking to someone at work and then the phone would ring and then I'd get interrupted and like immediately jump into that conversation on the phone or I would be on the phone and there'd be other people in the room having a conversation and there's just like, just, just, just constant noise. Yeah. So I think, you know, Gaddis really had his, his finger on the, the pulse um, of just kind of day to day life yeah and i think that was that was what pushed it to me to end up being my number one over same bed um it's just the way that it it, i had so many moments just going about my life that like felt like they could have been (laughs) in a sense lifted straight out of this novel that's cool you know it it almost felt like i was like in the truman show and and gaddis was kind of like behind the scenes like scripting out what was happening. Nice. So that was my my number one for the year. It has certainly cracked its way into my my top ten overall. Wow. Um so just cool. a, a fantastic novel. And without further ado, my top pick for twenty twenty three of the forty five ish books that I read is War Trash by Ha Jin. He is a uh, Chinese American author born in China. Um, and he is also a professor at BU, I believe. Uh, this book is about a soldier in the Chinese uh, communist uh, army, and he's been shipped out to North Korea to fight alongside the North Koreans in the Korean War. So uh, I read three books about the Korean bo- uh, War this year, um, The Bridge at Nogun Ri, Sandbed, Different Dreams, and War Trash. Uh, this is a, a fictional memoir, basically. Mm-hmm. I thought, on top of just the writing being excellent, uh, Ha Jin did such a good job of making it feel like a real memoir. Uh, but the pacing was very good. Uh, and I don't know, it just was a book that I loved it when I read it, and I just never stopped thinking about it throughout the whole year. And I knew this was going to be in my top two or three. And again, when I sat down and thought about it, I was like, yeah, this is this is probably the, my favorite book of the year. Uh, I loved it so much that basically um, whenever I, I walked into a used bookstore and saw a Hodgin uh, novel on the shelf, I was like, well, I'm just going to buy them all and I'll yeah. get to them eventually. Um, I think this also, very similar to uh, The Sympathizer, it's a story that we we haven't heard before. It's told from a perspective that we've never heard before, right? It's like um, 
a lot of people might be familiar with Vietnam or familiar with the Korean War uh, or familiar with communism in China, but all all of in the Western world is all told from a Western perspective or an American mm-hmm. perspective or the good guys perspective. Interesting to like read a story told from the perspective of um, not just a member of the communist army, but also like fighting yeah. in, in the Korean war because um, they were, you know, kind of like just the sidekicks uh-huh. to the North Koreans, uh, I guess for lack of a better term. Uh, although, you know, North Korea did receive a lot of support from the Soviet union and, and China. Uh, yeah. This one, the Penn Faulkner award, uh, yeah, just uh, I, I thought it was fantastic. I did reach out to Ha Jin to see if he could uh, participate in the podcast, seeing that he is in New England, but uh, unfortunately was at the time not available and, and kind of told me to, to check back with him later. Uh, he had some personal stuff going on. But, uh, yeah, I think um, this book – I think a lot of people would enjoy it. Uh, it's very approachable. It's not that long. The pacing was very good. And I uh, think would give you a new appreciation of the predicament that a lot of people in China probably found themselves in. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of times Americans have this, like, I, I hate to say this, but the only good communist is a dead communist, you know? And it's right. like, well, a lot of people just had no other choice but to participate in what was going on. Right. And uh, and the government that the Communist Party replaced uh, was certainly not doing the public and the citizens any favors. Um, yeah. You know, you could always point to certain uh, pockets of the population and be like, well, you know, this, this capitalist, uh, government would you look at how much wealth and blah, blah, blah there was. And it's like, right. But there was also people that were like dying in the streets of hungers. So, you know, it's kind of like a lose, lose situation for, uh, the Chinese people during this era. And, um, so this, this general period of history is very interesting to me. Um, in 2022, I read the last boat out of Shanghai, which was one of my favorite books of that year, which, also is about this period in history and, and the communist party's takeover of China. So um, yeah, if you are interested in a really kind of like, I don't want to say fun read cause it's kind of a sad, <laughs> sad topic, but uh, it is kind of a page turner and you do want to know what happens. Yeah. Uh, and, and you don't know anything about that period of history. This would be an excellent place to start. So that is my number one pick. Awesome. So those are our top 10. Uh, we have, how are you doing on time? You good? Yeah. Cool. So, um, very quickly, uh, what were the shortest and longest books you read this year? So the longest book I read was Antagony by Luis Goytisolo. And if I remember correctly, you didn't love it? I did not. Okay. It's, it's a little over 1,100 pages. Um, That's a long book to not love. <laughs> yeah, and I I um, did not think the juice was worth the squeeze. Okay. Um, it, Which happens. Okay. Yeah, it it is a long book to read and not end up really enjoying. I think part of what compelled me to keep reading it was the structure. Mm -hmm. So it's originally was when it was originally published in, um, um, not Spanish, um, Catalan. Mm -hmm. Cause it's from, it's the authors from Catalonia. Um, it was published as, as four separate novels. Mm. And in this English translation, they compiled them into one. Um, Essentially, what it is, it's it's sort of like a, a coming of age story of this young man, um, kind of leading up to and during the Spanish Civil War, um, and a little bit after, or, or during Franco's regime, um, who wants to be a novelist, mm. and what it kind of how it's structurally set up is the first three novels are his coming of age story. And then the final book is the novel that he ends up writing. Mm. And, you know, the the first book is the longest of the four. I think it's it's almost half the length. Not quite, but almost. Um, and I thought a lot of that was really good. You know, there's certainly some moments then where it kind of went on a little bit longer than I would have liked. But I, I was mostly interested throughout and, and captivated throughout that whole section. Um and then it just didn't really hold over. 
sure. through the other. And I think, you know, had it not been structured as like separate novels that, although they are kind of about one protagonist, they are kind of told from different perspectives. You know, I think had it just kind of been one, you know, 1100 page novel, I might have said, eh, this isn't cutting it. I'm, I'm going to have to <clears throat> cut my losses and, and move on. But there was part of me that was like, okay, maybe like, you know, this section, this, this section's only 200 pages. This was, you know, the second novel in the tetralogy that was published. Like maybe things are going to change in sure. the third. And then, you know, they really didn't. And then I was just kind of like, well, I'm 700 pages in. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Which, you know, typically I don't recommend doing like, you know, there is some kind of sunk cost there. Yeah. Um, but I think I was just kind of like, you know, let's, let's see what, what this payoff is because yeah. like I said, I was really intrigued by the the structure yeah. and kind of the, the setup and what it was all leading into, but it just didn't carry over for me. Mm. Um, I, I didn't think aside from like the first, first part that really much of anything happened mm. and it just, that's a bummer. I mean, that's a long book. Yeah. So. Uh, I think the longest book I read this year, if you want to say read, is uh, probably the Martin Luther King biography. I believe that's close to 700 pages, but uh -huh. I did that on an audio book. Um, but despite its length, I thought, uh, and it was, you can sometimes tell with an audio book, like if it would read well or uh -huh. it would be better as an audio book. I think, uh, I think it would be easy to read, not easy, but like uh, an approachable book of significant length if you were to do it on paper uh, and I had, I finished gravity's rainbow. Uh, I only got about 400 pages into that. That would have been the longest book. Uh, also actually you could say the same thing about uh, Musashi. Mm -hmm. I'm still working my way through. That's about a thousand pages. Um, so I think the, the longest physical book I read this year is probably either same bed, different dreams or the long ships. Uh, the NYRB long ships because I think that's a little over 500 pages as well. How long is Pay As You Go? Pay As You Go is about 500 as well, but I do think I think it's 500 even actually. Yeah, and I think yeah. um, I think Sam Bed's like 520. It's a little bit longer. Yeah, yeah and I think the long ships is maybe like 505 or 510, mm -hmm. so somewhere in there. So a couple, couple decently. It's a good solid like size for a book. Yeah, you know, I would consider like short short novels to be less than 200 pages. I mean, of course, there's stuff that's like 60 pages, but anything under 200 pages I consider short. Yeah. I think like 200 to 400 is kind of like your average. And I would say anything over like 400, 450-ish is I would consider a long book. Yeah. And then obviously anything that's like 700 or more is just like really a, a huge book. Yeah. I think, you know, prior to this year, maybe when I was a little bit more, I don't know, not snobbish, but particular like i would have i would have left the the big book classification for like anything like 700 yeah. pages plus yeah yeah um you know now that I've, I've i've changed my job and i have a little bit less like time to read you know i think i would push it in like anything in the like five to six hundred range plus yeah for sure um would would be my my big book mm -hmm. classification now so, and what was the shortest book you read, and, and what was its length? So, I have I have two picks for that because one of them um, is is sixty pages. Mm. It's a little pocket book from Coronasamas Dot. It's The Lift by Dimitri Kral. Kral I don't know how, to, how the hell to pronounce that last name? Kralj, correct? Kral. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, Eastern European name. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's just kind of this fun little. Um, I think uh, Rick Harsh described it as like it was like a radio play. Hmm. Um, you know, it's it's two guys stuck in an elevator. Nice. Um, and it has this, you know, a lot of metafictional hijinks. It has some kind of existential elements to it. Yep. Um, you know, just kind of a fun little witty book. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other book I brought over, the, the total length of the book, cover to cover is about 80 something pages. Yeah. But... I think, let's see if there's a table of contents. Um, yeah, the actual novel itself doesn't begin until page 27. Yeah. So there's a, a significant, I think the intro is like 20 pages. Yeah, the intro starts on page nine and then 
Yeah. That's about 20 pages. And then the, the novel itself. So is only about 50. Um, and that is the whole by Jose Revu Revolutes. Revolutes. Um, it's from new directions. It is about, and it's, it's, you can very easily read it in like, um, one sitting yeah. 30 to 60 minutes. It's mm. kind of the intention behind it. Um, it kind of just takes place like in real time, you know, the, the start of the novel is the start of the narrative and then it ends with the end, but it's about, um, three prisoners and they are trying to get, um, significant others and or family members to sneak drugs in for oh, them. Cool. Um, but it's this very classic tale. <laughs> yeah. It's this very dark, gritty, um, short little narrative, uh, really well written. Very interesting. Um, I read it twice. I, I, I think I like had a week between readings or something like that, but I've talked to a couple other people who read it this year who like finished it and immediately went back to the first Interesting. page. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's one of those books where like, it's so short. Why not? I think realistically, I think I, I probably read it in 30 to 45 minutes. Yeah. Um, so you certainly can do that. Um, and it just, you have a little bit better sense of what happens mm -hmm. and, and, um, kind of how the narrative unfolds. So, yeah, I think the shortest book I read this year was either the Pearl by John Steinbeck, which is about 96 ish pages. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that's about a, um, like a fisherman, basically, a, a you know, a poor, poor fisherman that discovers a, a very valuable Pearl and how that affects his life and the family. Uh, or, um, maybe the hospital by Ahmed Buonani, uh, who is a Moroccan filmmaker and author. Um, like like you had mentioned, uh, I think the introduction's like 37 pages. Yeah. The total length of the, the printing is 137, so it's right around 100 pages. Yeah. Um, so it's either one of those two books. Um, and the hospital was inspired by Buonani's time in a hospital when he had tuberculosis. Oh. Uh, so it's kind of a... Uh, I would say maybe like experimental, very hallucinatory story. Yeah. Um, very out there, very bizarre. Uh, some interesting poetic writing mixed in with some of the most like lewd scenarios, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, interesting read. Uh, yeah. That was also a, a new directions. Yeah. They, they published some great, Great books, especially like short little books that just, you yeah. know, pack a punch. I um, I meant to, because I, I do all of my tracking through Goodreads, and mm -hmm. I meant to, before I came over here today, transfer that over to, to Storygraph to get a little bit more of an analytical breakdown yeah. and just kind of see how um, like page counts and stuff broke yep. down. Um, but my average book length was like 270-something pages. I know probably... I would say at least half of the books that I read or around there were under I'll say 220. Yeah. Um and I'm sure a pretty significant chunk of those were like 150 or less, yeah. or, you know, something like that. So um and what would you say was uh kind of like the most um out of left field for you that you read this year that's not that something typically you would read? Uh definitely Eric LaRocco's book of short stories. What was it? The, the trees grew because I bled there. Yes. Yeah. Something yep. like that. Um, that was actually my pick. Uh, yeah. As well. It not, not the type of book I would have picked out for yep. myself. Um, I think we know. both enjoyed it too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say I don't read a lot of horror <clears throat> and I don't read a lot of short stories and it's short story horror. Right. Um, yeah. I think for part of it for me, like what was so, not interesting, but what what like made it a little bit more compelling for me is it's not like strictly horror. You know, they're not like ghost stories. It's not uh, supernatural. It's more th psycho thriller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. It, it's more yeah, like you said, psychologically kind of tortuous. Yeah, in a way. Yep, I agree. So um, that would definitely be my most like out of left field, you know, thing that I was kind of surprised by. Yeah, the other book I would say for me was uh, Babel by R.F. Kuang. Mm. It was it was okay. I didn't love it. I didn't hate it. Uh, but that's definitely like a book that was like big on book talk. And right. You walk into 
Barnes and Noble and it's prominently right displayed. There, yeah. and, you know, it's dark academia and it's right. Yeah. I don't want to stereotype, but like a lot of like younger women love that book and you yeah. know, just not really the type of thing I would typically read. I did it as a group read and I was the only person to actually finish it. <laughs> I think I was the only guy in the group also. Yeah. Not that those two things are related, but um, just kind of funny. So, uh, okay. Um, Let's. Uh, Did you have any new authors that you read for the first time and kind of so honestly, discovered? Um, honestly, the only authors that weren't new for me this year. Let me just pull it up very quickly. If Goodreads is working, because the app was not cooperating last night. Yeah, it was working for me fine this morning. So, um. The only authors that were reread uh, or, or not new authors for me were Paul Harding because I'd read Tankers. Uh-huh. I read another Primo Levy this year, which I'd, I'd read him before. Yeah. Oh, Cormac McCarthy. I'd read uh-huh. a Cormac McCarthy before. But yeah, a lot of notable new people for me. Pynchon. Yep. Um, uh, Marquez. That was my first Marquez. Um, uh, who else is like noteworthy? My first Herman Hess this year. Uh, Demian, um, my first Bulgakov. So a lot of other authors I read for the first time. A lot of new authors, but, you, they're, yeah. but they're not 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 really like household names. Yeah. Well. So, uh, what about you? New authors for you? I, I read a, a ton. I mean, there's definitely a, a ton of new authors that I read. Um, just out of this this stack here, um, Joshua Cohen. Mm-hmm. I read the Netanyahu's. I read one of his other books, Michael Winkler. You know, Dave Fitzgerald, Ed Park, mm-hmm. you know, um, I'm sure that, you know, it read 120 books, like the, a lot <laughs> right, of it were, right. you know, new authors. But um, the the biggest standout amongst those was Clarice Lispector. Cool. Uh, just such a, an interesting, um, interesting author, both in the thematic ideas she gets at in her work um, and also her style. Mm. Is, is very unique and um you know i i've i i've talked a lot or use this phrase a lot when talking about writers but like the the pyrotechnics mm-hmm. of their writing i think a lot of um a lot of the times when i talk about that it's like the the stylistic qualities mm-hmm. are very you know explosive um, and, and flashy, but with Le Spectre, it's more the, the technicality yeah. of the writing is, is very unique and idiosyncratic and, and like I said, pyrotechnical. So, um, definitely one of my favorite discoveries of, of this year. I read, um, three of her, her novels. I read her, um, collected short stories. Um, and I've been picking at too much of life. Um, mm-hmm. Definitely looking forward. I've got, I've got a couple more of her novels at home that I haven't read that I'm looking forward to. And then, you know, there's a few others of hers that I just haven't picked up yet um, that I really am interested in as well. So cool. All right. Let's um, breeze. We'll, we'll rock it through these uh, questions yeah. that we received uh, in anticipation for this episode. And then we'll talk about our 2024 goals. Sure. This will be one of our longest episodes yet. Um, obviously, we're covering a whole year. So uh, we'll go back and forth. Um, so Caleb Welch 9 on Instagram asks, have y'all read the Pegasus editions of the Musketeer cycle? If so, what do you think of it? Um, no, the only Alexander Dumas I have read is uh, the Count of Monte Cristo. I do have a copy of... Uh, the Three Musketeers. I don't know anything about that particular edition. So, um, Caleb, if you I, I don't even know what what's special about the Pegasus edition, so if you want to fill us in, I, I yeah, believe I got, you haven't I, read any Dumas either, yeah. Or, or yeah. So, uh, yeah. What do you got? All right. Um, I only have uh, one question. This, or the others are just kind of people talking about their favorites, and yeah, um, we'll shout them out. But uh, this question is from Eleventh Volume. If you could only reread one book for the rest of your life, what would it be if you couldn't pick Gravity's Rainbow? <laughs> Jeez. Uh, God damn you. Um, one book for the rest of my life. 
you know, the Count of Monte Cristo would probably be in the in the running just uh-huh. because it is such a long book and there's a lot to it and it's a great story and you could read it multiple times and, and get a lot out of it each time. Oh, man. Uh, if not that, I would say maybe... Um, that's really hard. I'll, yeah. I'll just stick with that, I guess. Yeah, I would probably... For a a straight novel, I would probably pick either Infinite Jest hmm. or um, either of Gaddis's two big books, just because you know there's there's with all three of those there's sections that you can read just for pure entertainment. Yeah, there's sections you can read for like you know lighthearted entertainment. There's sections that you can read that are more dramatic mm-hmm. and would be more um you know emotionally moving and then there's parts of that you that you can read that are really thought provoking and kind of have some bigger ideas um that pertain to just outside the narrative or, or pertain to more than just the narrative of the book yeah um or i might pick um a short story collection either mm, um call, yeah. either borges or Lispector, yeah, Pro- probably, probably Borges out yeah. of those two. I mean, I I loved um, Lispector's work. There's a lot of great short stories in that collection, but mm-hmm. I think there were total volume of stories I enjoyed versus just felt kind of neutral about. I think I I enjoyed more of more stories out of Borges's collected mm-hmm. works. Keep fooding around. Uh, asked favorite book from each genre. Uh, I don't think this is an answerable question. Yeah, simply because there are, I get almost an infinite amount of genres depending on how you prefer to to slice them up. Um, and we simply just don't have the time to. to yeah, to say I don't that. really think I read within genres either. I think for the most part. Everything I read um, has a little bit of yeah could be could be classified a few different ways. So I don't and, and I don't think I can really accurately answer that. Shameless plug, but we did a top five all time episode a few months back. So uh, not to dodge your question, uh, keep fooding around. But um, yeah, we appreciate. We the question, we also but. have a uh, favorite books in translation. Yeah, that's coming that's, out. In a that'll of be weeks. coming out soon. Yep. Uh, Moss uh, Neo Bizid said, "Do you guys read any poetry?" Uh, I don't really. Um, we very, very, very early on in the incarnation of Tony's going to make something to put on the internet. I did interview a poet named Patrick Meehan, and I did read um, his most recent release or he might have something out new now but uh it was called mamica Uh uh he's also a professor of poetry i thought that was pretty cool um i would say just in general poetry is not really like my thing but always open to uh anyone that has you know some poetry they think will blow my socks off yeah that's actually something i've gotten a little bit into this year i certainly i haven't read a ton but um I read um, a handful of Rainer Maria Rilke's books. Um, mm. He's an Austrian poet, very influential to some of my favorite authors. Um, he, Gass was a huge fan of his. Um, I don't know if he was as directly influential on Gaddis, but um, some of Rilke's work is definitely alluded to. Um, especially in the recognitions, mm-hmm. um, and also um, some of uh, so his his Rilke's two most famous works would be the Dunio elegies and uh, sonnets to Orpheus or for Orpheus, mm. yeah, something sonnets something Orpheus. Um, both of those were pretty influential. I learned were pretty influential on Gravity's Rainbow. Mm. So. It certainly is a very interesting um, poet and has some very wonderful verses um, and some some great writing. Um, but 
I, I started off reading his work more so to have a better understanding and appreciation of the works and authors that he was influential on. Um, and I also, you know, after reading one of them, I kind of put out a, a call to Instagram, like, Hey, does anyone have any recommendations? Like this is something I would like to get more into. Um, one poet that someone recommended was, uh, Louise Gluck. Um, I believe she actually recently passed away. Mm -hmm. Um, she was, uh, a, a Nobel laureate. Um, and I, uh, recently read while well, I was in quarantine, um, one of her books, it was, um, like a collection of her first four books of poetry. Um, and those were really good. Those are really, some of those were really moving mm. um, and, and just really well written. I did pick up a collection of um, her like um, volume of work kind of in one, one book. Um, and then lastly, you know, I, I, for anyone that doesn't know, I was recently uh, in quarantine with, with COVID and I just kind of like, not necessarily picking at stuff, but just kind of grabbing things and going and going. Um, yeah. And I also read some of Fernando Pessoa, who was a um, Portuguese poet. He's a very interesting guy. He actually um, published under uh, works under several different aliases. Um, so the, the the book I had been reading from was a kind of collection of works from each of those different aliases, as well as some of the stuff he published under his own name. Um, and it's, it's actually interesting. There were, it's funny looking at it because you know it was broken down by like section. Like this is what was from this this name and this name, you know and so on. Um, and there were definitely um, stylistic differences between the the four and um, aliases that I preferred to the others. Hmm. So cool. Yeah, there you go. And he's got more poetry under his belt than I do. Uh, if you go back and watch the the Patrick Meehan episode or listen to it uh i believe it's still hosted everywhere youtube and, and spotify and whatnot uh you will get hopefully an appreciation of how far uh this podcast has come as far <laughs> as production value and and perhaps my ability as an interviewer um so yeah and it was a good it was a good interview he was an interesting guy nice guy um so uh stage crew kid on instagram asks who are some other good bookstagram accounts that you guys like and are fans of? Again, I will let you kind of answer this. Um, I, I hate to say this as an answer. Uh, however, over the last couple of years, I have actually become pretty good at using Instagram and social media uh, as a tool and not falling into that doom scrolling mm -hmm. and consuming too much. Um, not that I, it's not that I don't follow other people that I, I love and appreciate. Uh, however, um, you know, I, I just don't follow anyone in particular that I would say is like, uh, I'm looking at their account all the time. It's, it's just really like whatever's popping up in my feed. Uh -huh. Um, I will just throw a couple names out. Uh, I will say, um, HV book nerd. Yes. Um, it's fantastic. Um, I would say uh, 11th volume, uh, nonfiction fervor are, are um, some great accounts. Uh, there's a woman on TikTok. Um, I believe her name is Morgan, uh, and, and her handle is, I think, nonfiction queer. Uh, she always has, like, fantastic recommendations and is reading quite a bit. Um, a lot of books that she's read and recommended have ended up on my list. Um, so those are kind of, like, my top three or four. Uh, I... I I love all of the conversations that I've had uh, with people on the online community, but shamefully, most of it is happening either in the comment section of something I've posted mm -hmm. or in DMs. Yeah. Um, so uh, apologies. I, I mean, there's so And the other thing, too, is there are so many people posting awesome, cool photos right. of books right. with great reviews or whatever. Uh, and so it's hard to keep up with. And for whatever reason, I'm pretty good with people's names. I'm not good with like <laughs> handles. I yeah. can never like remember people's handles. So, uh, yeah. And, and you've certainly been involved, uh, in the online book community, perhaps a little bit longer than I have. So yeah, I'm going to certainly miss some people here. Um, there's a lot of uh, great accounts. Um, quite frankly, if you go to 
to, to my page and click on my people I follow. Yes, that's probably the best, that's way, probably the best way to get through like everybody. Um, I'm just going to read off some names. These are people that I've recently uh, engaged with, especially through like messaging on Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, I will also say I'm not very, I'm not on TikTok at all. So I don't have any good follows there. Um, and some of these people also have YouTube channels. So, yeah. Um, so, uh, OD1 underscore 40 reads. He's a great follow. Uh, um, Sixth Circle. He's great. Mm -hmm. uh, HV Book Nerd. Kevin. Shout yeah. out to Kevin. Kevin's awesome. Um, Jonathan Golding. What's his handle? Uh, Jonathan Golding underscore books. He's awesome. He posts some really great, great photos of books, but also really substantial like reviews and and share some, some great thoughts. Um, Seth at Waste Mailing List oh, is of course, awesome. Yeah. Uh, Travis at Myers Metafictional Musings. Yep. He's great. Um, and I should say all of these people like they, they post great content, but they're also like good people. Yeah, that, um, yeah. Actually, everyone you've named thus far, like I've had at least some interaction with. You know, and always I, good I've, discussion. Like I've traded books with um, most. Not unfortunately, Seth. Seth lives in Australia, so it's kind of hard to to trade books with him. <laughs> Correct. Um, but like Kevin, Jonathan, Travis, I've I've done like book trades with all of them. Um, we mentioned eleventh volume. He's great. Uh, Sean at Travels Through Stories. He's got a pretty interesting um, presence. He oh. posts some great YouTube content as well. Bad reads, reviews. Hilarious. You got you yes. to follow them. And uh, what's the other really funny um, kind of meme account? Uh, God damn it. See, I'm terrible with, I'm terrible yeah. with, with the handles. Um, something to do with Faulkner, right? Do you know what I'm talking about? I don't, actually. Um, and I'll just drop one more in there. The, the Mother Faulkner. Oh, the Mother Faulkner. That's funny. It's a great account. Um, Shout out to one, you. one more one. Uh, Chris Via, Leaf by Leaf. Oh yes, He's of course. Fantastic. Uh, a lot of really, really great, um, reviews, uh, especially on YouTube. Uh, Kyle Poland. He's another yep. great, great poster. Um, I could go on and on. Like I said, I, I'm leaving out a lot of people. I'm mostly yeah, just I, reading I'm, off names that I, um have interacted with recently so yeah if you go to either andy's the people he follows or the people i follow uh you will find people that have uh good quality content and and have certainly inspired me yeah so i uh, really apologize uh, i know my answer was a little, <laughs> little weak and, and somewhat elitist but um Okay, so I do have a few more questions here. I'm going to chime in just because I've gotten a few people. Like I said, I only had one question, but I do have some people that shared some um, favorites. Um, sixth, sixth Circle, one of the accounts I just named, uh, he said one of his favorites from the year was Same Bed, Different Dreams. Fantastic. He's looking forward to reading some Gaddis in 2024. Nice. Uh, the Bookish Mank, who runs mm -hmm. a yep. podcast. I don't know. We, we just forgot to shout them out for yeah. people to follow. <laughs> um he runs a podcast, Chatting Lit. Yep. Um, actually, um, how I found a lot of the accounts that I follow when I first started getting into the whole Bookstagram thing. Um, his favorite book of 2023 was Paradeus by Fernanda Melkor, Malco mm -hmm. which I read as well. It's a fantastic book. It's only 120-something pages. You could read it in a sitting. Um, and he is looking forward to Same Bed, Different Dreams in 2024. Love that. And uh, we also got a quick shout-out from Brody... He Brody Nick, uh, nothing to say, just thanks for keeping me entertained. I appreciate that you two keep it real. So shout out to Nick for listening and uh, everybody else for listening. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I do I do hope we keep it real. I think, um, I don't want to speak for you, Andy, but I do think that I probably don't necessarily fit the mold of someone who looks like they read a lot of books or... No talk about books or speaks like someone that reads a lot of books. I, I, I think if um, you showed someone on the street a picture of us and we're like, what are these two, what books do these two talk about? Right. You would probably think it's a lot of like personal development, self right. help, maybe World War II. We look like average white dudes. Yeah. I, I always do get a chuckle when I bring my books to the counter of any bookstore and uh, you know, um, kind of get a, sometimes a look of surprise when yeah. people see what they're what they're checking me out for. Yeah. Um, 
So uh, a couple more questions here. This one is from uh, Benjamin Heels. And Benjamin says, Tony, you said you have a goal of reading a book from every country. How's your progress? Uh, great question. Uh, appreciate that. So with the book from every country thing, what you'll find a lot of times when you find uh, articles or, or stories of people who have done this, a lot of people make it a goal to do it within a year. And there's, you know, 300 ish countries in the world. And so, you know, that's a little bit antithetical to my beliefs about not right. trying to read a lot. Um, for me, I don't have a specific date on it. So I'm just kind of casually going along. What I found very early on is I, I tried to compile a list of a book from every country. So that way I could just like, know what to buy. Right. And what I found was that was a lot of work. And sometimes you would find a book and, and there wasn't a ton of recommendations from that country. So you'd like throw it on your list. And then later on, I would stumble across something that was like more interesting to me. So I'm kind of just letting it happen as it happens. Right. I'm trying to mix in a book from an author from a country I haven't read yet every once in a while. Uh, but as an American, you tend to read a lot of books written in English uh, to begin with so that, you know, you're reading a lot of American or, or British authors. Um, but I would say I'm doing pretty well. Uh, to my own surprise, when I kind of look back at my life and, and what I've already read before I kind of started this project, I actually had read a decent amount of variety. Mm -hmm. um, this year I read from a couple of German authors, Italian, uh, South Korean, couple Latin Americans, you know, Marquez, um, Samantha Schweblin's from Argentina. I read an author from Venezuela. Um, ha Jin's Chinese. Um, I'm reading Mishima right now who's Japanese. Um, uh, um, the Sympathizer, you know, if you want to count that, I guess. We've had some discussion about what counts, what doesn't. Yeah. You know, he's Vietnamese, American. Um, Escor is... We got the, okay, I was going to say, you got the okay from Escor to yeah, count that. Yeah, he's a Trini author. Uh, so it's going pretty well. I would say that um, I, as you progress as a reader and you develop your, your taste change, and I am really interested in, in Asian literature, so this year coming up, I'm probably going to get kind of stuck reading a lot of like China, Japan, Korea. Yeah. Um, but I do want to tackle like Malaysia. Uh, I'm pretty weak in... Uh, Eastern European, despite, you know, I've read Russians, obviously. Um, but, uh, you know, I want to check. Uh, I'll, I'll probably do a, my first Krasna Horkai this mm -hmm. year. So check off Hungary. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's going well. That's the very long-winded answer. Um, I actually picked up recently a book from an Indonesian author. Oh, that cool, I'm pretty yeah. That i in checking out. Um, what is it? It's called Home. Okay. I cannot think of the author's name off the top of my head. Um, it was published by Deep Vellum. Um Maybe, you know, keep me posted when you do that because I might want to do it with you. Yeah, so what, what really drew me in, so it, the, the audio book that I listened to, um, the, one of the only nonfictions I got around to, it was The Jakarta Method yes. by Vincent Bevins. Yep. Um, and it's all about, like, how kind of communism in um, Indonesia or the rise of communism in Indonesia was put down by, with a lot of support from America yeah. and how that kind of approach to stopping the, the spread of communism took place in other countries and America had their hand in it in a lot of other countries. Yeah. Um, and uh, this, bo this book, Home, is fictionalized telling of things that happened during that time period in Indonesia. Cool. So. Yeah, I think um, when you start a project like Reading the World, what you'll find is a lot of Google searches will return books written by Americans about foreign countries, right. which aren't, are not aren't by default bad. But I do try to, you know, uh, uh, even if I'm interested in that topic, I do try to go for the person who's telling it from you know personal experience. Yeah, I think um, we, we talked about this before, too. I think if you kind of set yourself out to just do that, you kind of pigeonhole yourself into a very narrow type of reading. Yes. And eventually it starts to feel more like a chore than pleasure. Exactly. And it's like, you know, yeah, I've read three different Japanese authors and now I've come across another Japanese author I want to read. Am I not going to read it because I've, I've already, already read, read Japan? Like, so, you know, it's an interesting project. It, for me, it's probably going to take, I would say, 
five years for me to complete, yeah. honestly, if I'm being totally honest. So um, let's do one more question. Okay. Uh, perfect. Cause I only have one more real one. Uh, Des wasp 108 says, what book would you, or wouldn't you want to experience as one of the characters? Um, uh, well, for, I'll, I'll go first with would not, um, <laughs> probably, uh, uh, the main character in war trash or the sympathizer, uh, which were both in my yeah. my top ten, wouldn't want to be them. What about you? I certainly wouldn't want to be um, Joe Grimm from Grimmish and just his ass getting my ass kicked night after night after night after night. Um, character, what I want to be? I would definitely say, uh, um, like you know, if my life were grandiose, uh, probably Sidney Carton from. Um, a Tale of Two Cities by mm. Dickens. Uh, you know, it doesn't end well for him. Spoiler alert! But you yeah. know, uh, you know, he goes out on top, kind of yeah. like as a G. I um, <laughs> sorry, if, sorry if that spoils it for you. Guys. You know, I, I I think at least out of these top ten, I would uh, I would like to experience life as J.R. Van Zant and just like <laughs> be a six year old, being uh, a six boss. sixth grader, just running a um, you know, corporate empire and um not really facing any consequences for the way in which I do it. Yeah. So. Fantastic. All right. So um, I did have one more question, which was from the book binders daughter on Instagram. And she says, which books are you looking forward to reading most in 2024? So we will segue this into answering that question, but also just quickly talking about what our goals are as readers and uh, influencers oh, in 2024. Boy. Oh boy. Um, I mean, I could go on and on with the books that I would like to read. Give me like 24. Just give me like two. Um, two. one that I would definitely like to read is, uh, against the day by pension. Mm -hmm. Um, I mentioned it. I think the most anticipated reads was one of the ones that got left on the cutting room floor. Um, but that's the only pension I have left. Um, I, I you know, I'm ready to, to kind of come full circle. Yeah. Um, I've been pretty interested. It's, it's kind of obviously been interested in for a while in, in for a while, but it's recently kind of, um, piqued my interest a lot more and I'm, I'm a lot more curious about it. So I would like to get to that soon. Um, I'm really looking forward to reading big bang by David Bowman, mm -hmm. um, which was something that Ed Park has spoken very highly of. Yeah. Um, I think I'll give one more, um, the Logos by Mark De Silva, which is another thousand-page novel. Mm. Um, I've heard it. Um, a lot of people that I interact with and whose opinions I really trust have spoken very highly of it. Um, and I've heard um, it kind of compared to a, a cross between um, The Recognitions by Gaddis and A Naked Singularity by Sergio de la Pava, which are two of my favorite novels. So... I'm interested to see how it all shakes out. Very cool. Um, I'll give a, a an answer of one one fiction and one nonfiction. I mean, I'm looking like you said, looking forward to so many books. It's hard to pick. Right. Um, one book I thought I would get to this year that I did not was Warlock by Oakley Hall, which is one of your favorite books. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm definitely going to do that in 2024. I'm looking forward to that. And then for nonfiction. Um, there is a book about uh, North Korea called Nothing to Envy um, by Barbara Demick, and it's probably one of the most highly regarded books about North Korea that I have not read. I've mm -hmm. read quite a few books about North Korea. Um, definitely kind of a, an interest of mine, so really looking forward to doing that one as well. Um, I'll talk quickly about my goals. Uh, as a reader, I will say that um, my goal for 2023 was to read a minimum one page per day mm -hmm. and to really enjoy everything I read. And to, what that means is to not force myself to finish something if I'm not loving it. I did read a couple books that I, I just didn't love. But again, it was kind of a situation where it's like, I'm already pretty far in, just finish it so you can give it a fair shake yep. overall. Um, and I would say by and large, I hit that goal. There was probably only maybe like five to seven days throughout the entire year where I didn't read at least one page. And um, the reason that was the goal was like, if you read one, you're probably going to read two, you're probably going to uh -huh, read 10. Uh -huh. 
Uh, and it's like that trick of like, I'm tired. I want to go to bed, dude, you can read one page. Right. Um, the only time I didn't read at least one page was like, uh, unfortunately I am prone to migraines. Um, although I've done some things this year that have improved that. And so there were a couple of days where it's just like, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. Um, so other than that, yeah, I read at least one page per day. So my goal for 24 as a reader is to read a minimum of an hour a day cumulatively on average. Nice. Uh, and so um, what that could mean is like, you know, maybe some days I'll read two hours and mm -hmm. the next day I'll read, read only a half hour. But, um, you know, I did spend some time tracking my social media use. And uh, if once you kind of factor out like my time spent like posting content and, and responding to comments and whatnot, um, I did still realize like, okay, you can probably still minimize that social media time. Um, and one thing that you had said, uh, in the last couple of weeks is that you read in the morning before you go to work. And yeah. I was like, you know what? Um, if I do, if I just do that, if I just do 15, 20 minutes in the morning, I can make that one hour a day, right. uh, much more doable. Um, and I, you know, I don't really think I have another goal as a reader other yeah. than that. Yeah. Before I get into my goals, I will say one thing that I think if someone's trying to get into that, like reading a page of a day cycle, um, I think something like like poetry collections could be great for that mm -hmm. because you can literally just read one page, and if you only have the the stamina and the bandwidth for one page, you're not going to get um, caught in like the middle of a paragraph or yeah, you know, be be unsure of where you you left off in the the thread of the narrative because it might just be eight lines. It's funny you say that because uh, there weren't many times where I did only read one page. Most of the time I read more than one. Right. But there were a few books where I was like, I literally just, I can't keep my eyes open. Yeah. Um, I'm just so tired. I want to go to sleep. And so I did only read one page. And for certain books that was, uh, you almost felt silly. Right. You're just like, I mean, okay, certainly cool. the intent behind it, like you said, is right. to, okay, I read one, I'll read two, and then right. that turns right. into five and right. 10 and so on. Um, but, you know, if you're someone who, you know, is maybe getting not sure how to start on that track um, or, you know, you need some to build some momentum, yeah. um, I think, you know, try try reading some poetry. Even yeah. if, you know, I, I, I'm certainly not like the biggest fanatic about poetry i can't speak very um intellectually about I mean, any I, of i can't speak intellectually period so. <laughs> um you know, you know i i cert certainly can't get very deep into any of the the works of poetry that i've read but i think you know that could be a, a starting point for someone trying to get to that um page a day uh in terms of my my goals i certainly don't have um any quantitative goals um mm -hmm. or really any sort of, you, you know, um, like page count or reading time goals. I think I already do a good job of reading, reading daily. You know, if anything, I would like to read at least a number of books less, you sure, know. Yeah. Um, one thing I would like to do as a reader is engage more, engage more with the books I'm reading. Mm -hmm. um, I already think I do a good job of being like an active reader and, you know, kind of, highlighting bracketing underlining some some annotations here and there of stuff that i like i mean if you i'll just use my like copy of jr as an example you know i've got a handful of stickies in here mm -hmm. you know i'll come across something that i like bracket it underline it whatever and pop a sticky in it um but i think one thing that i've you know kind of fallen in the trap of is like i do that i read the book actively i sticky it and then it goes back on the shelf right so um something that I, I would like to be, do more of in, in the new year and, and going forward is, is keeping more of like a commonplace book. Um, and whether it's like, while I'm reading it, um, taking some notes about what I'm, you know, highlighting um, or annotating in the book, or I finish the book, I put it back on the shelf and I let it breathe for a few weeks. And then I come back and I yeah. examine those, those sections that I um, highlighted. Yeah. And and seeing if they still like have the same effect of, on me out of context um, and, and try to examine them a little bit more closely. You know, if, if I, excuse me, say have um, three sections 
that I have put stickies in and, and highlighted kind of writing things, you know, writing them down in there and then examining like, okay, what's the common thread yeah. between these? Is there something there connecting these three um, passages or are they just like things that I really enjoyed the style of and that's it, you know? Yeah. And, and um, like you had kind of said earlier, um, you know, just, almost writing essays about yeah. what you're reading. So well, trying to get you to write reviews for the, the live on books <laughs> website, which we don't do much with yet. So. so, you know, I think that's, that's only my, um, main goal. Yep. I, I think, um, you know, like I said, at the beginning, I, I've kind of checked off most of the great books yep. that I kind of, compiled the list of when I was yeah. getting into reading. Um, so there's not, there's not a ton anymore that I feel compelled to read yeah. outside of my own interest in it, yeah. whether it's, you know, something for entertainment or um, something to be a little bit more studious with. Yeah. But, you know, I just want to read um, and engage with what I'm reading and enjoy it. So I don't, really have any specific goals outside of that. Cool. So we have one thing left to do, which is we're going to pick a book for each other to read this year. But before we do that, just speaking on goals, I just want to say as far as goals for life on books goes, um, there's so much on the internet. And when you look at the comments in the video I posted yesterday about, you know, upping your total book count every year, um, so many people mentioned, you know, I, I read to try to curtail my doom scrolling. And so it's always been very important for me that what I post to the internet brings some type of value mm-hmm. and, and is positive. And so for me, I think uh, my goals for life on books in 2024 and, and moving forward, especially now that I have a much clearer idea of kind of like what we do, <laughs> um, is I really want to be considered like the best book related social media period. Oh, damn. Um, and I don't mean that in the sense of like, I want everyone to think I'm the best. I want to put out the best content. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I want to, I want to just bring push it to a, a, a new level, do it better. Um, be able to promote, you know, authors that I think we, we think deserve it. Uh, to help people find new books that they might enjoy, uh, to um, just entertain people, you know, at, at a higher level and uh, uh, to become like, you know, for lack of a better term, like the the number one book-related podcast, whether that includes bringing on, you know, uh, more guests uh, or whatever it is. You know, I, I really want to refine my skills as an interviewer to ask compelling questions. You know, it was a little bit of, um, it was very gratifying in both the escort and Ed interviews. I asked some questions that both of them had to like pause and yeah. like, Oh, you know what? I haven't been asked that before or, you know, it's a good question. Um, and so I think, uh, I think we have a good vibe, uh, the two of us together. Um, and, and you certainly, uh, uh, bring a great uh, approach to the interviews as well. So I just want to take all of that uh, to the next level. And uh, despite me saying, you know, earlier, like don't tell people how to make their content, you know, obviously we're always open to feedback, yep. um, suggestions about topics, or if there's something you think, uh, you know, people would enjoy that we could execute on. One thing I do want to get back to doing, which I didn't do much of this year is like the, the five to 10 minute video essays mm-hmm. uh, for YouTube but I want to do those in a much more grandiose cinematic way. So, um, you know, that's just time to, I just got to find out the time resource. So yeah. anyway, enough. We've, we've been blathering for nearly three <laughs> hours now. So without further ado, um, we are going to pick a book for each other to read. I'm excited to see what you got there. For, um, I'm uh, seeing it's not too thick, which is yeah. good. 
Um, my pick for you is A Novel to Read on the Train by Dimitru Sepanag. I don't think I've ever even heard you talk about this. Um, it's something I read at the beginning of the year. Mm. Um, that was actually a gift to me from our good friend Kevin at the HV Book Nerd. Oh, very cool. Um, really interesting novel. Um, he's a Romanian author. It was actually originally written in French, though. Okay. I don't um, think I've done Romania yet. He so was, perfect. like I said, he's a Romanian author. If I remember correctly, he was uh, basically left Romania in exile. Oh, wow. Um, so when I pulled it off the shelf, I actually don't I don't remember sticky, putting as many sticky notes in it as <laughs> I did. It's got a cool cover. Um, so it's a very interesting novel. Um, it's basically kind of quick synopsis. Um, it is about um, a director trying to adapt a... A short story into a movie. Oh, cool. That's right um, on my alley. And um, actually, I have not read it yet, but from what I've picked up, I think um, just looking into the book and reading the intro, the the short story that he's adapting is one that was written by Sepanayag. Oh, cool. So, um, but it's a really interesting novel. Um, the There's a, a really um, kind of a blend of like what's taking place in the the film they're trying to make mm -hmm. and what just how the, the actors are interacting offset. Yeah. There's a lot of overlap. So sometimes it's kind of tricky. Like, nice. is this, are they, are they live? Are they rolling? Or are they right, just kind right. of like hanging out between takes? Like what's happening? Interesting. So, you know, honestly, I might start my 2024 with this tomorrow. So yeah, it's, it's a really great read. Um, and I think you'll enjoy it. All right. I'll be right back. I'll grab uh, your book off the bookshelf. All right. We had set a limit of, of 400 pages. And the book that first came to mind when we started talking about this was The Last Boat Out of Shanghai. Uh -huh. But this book is 500. <laughs> um, it's not a hard 500. And I would say a lot of it is like the uh, the bibliography. Yep. So the actual book itself is like 420-ish. So I will give you a choice, either The Last Boat Out of Shanghai or Shadow Divers. Ooh. Shadow Divers is one of my favorites, but this is, book is just like more pure entertainment, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where I think this book is like more the type of thing that like, you know, culturally important. Gotcha. Um, but you knew it was going to be nonfiction. I, because I had to know, yeah. 1.6% 1, 1. of your uh, books this year <laughs> were, were nonfiction. So I'll, I will leave it up to you. Mm. I can't decide right now. I'll, I'll okay. take them both take home them with both. me and uh, come to a decision at home. All right. I think that is it for yeah, today. I don't um, have anything else to say. Uh, yeah. Thanks for sticking with us if you if you did. And thank you to everyone who made 2023 such a fantastic year for readers. And we will see all of you in 2024. See ya.